Council members and citizens of Tampa, Tampa City Council will now come to order on February 24, 2022. Workshop agenda today. I think Mr. Carlson we have downstairs on the second floor. Mr. Carlson? There he is. Are we on? Morning, sir. Morning. Um, we're doing the accommodation now? No, sir. We're doing Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, okay. And invocations. I don't have anybody doing pledge allegiance. Who has it today? Is Mr. Do you have it today, Mr. Carlson? No? I don't have it today. All right. Well, we'll oh, do a um, moment of silence, Mike. Our our individual had a um, a family tragedy happen, and we have to do a moment of silence. So. All right. Well, we'll do a moment of silence and also a prayer for our good friend, Mr. Dingfeld, who's not with us today. And prayers for oh, the people of uh, the Ukraine also. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Mr. Shelby. Yes, thank Ro you. I'm sorry, sir. Roll call. Roll call. Make sure we Carlson. Have Down here. Maniscalco. Here. Dingfelder. Citro. Here. Vieira. Here. Miranda. Here. Goulds. Here. We have a physical quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Mr. Shelby. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of Tampa City Council. Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney. We're here on Thursday, February 24th of 2022 at Old City Hall, 315 East Kennedy Boulevard. And during the COVID-19 state of emergency, meetings and workshops of the Tampa City Council are being conducted with a live in-person quorum with City Council present and City Council chambers. However, in response to the COVID-19 restrictions, members of the public are encouraged to partic participate virtually through video teleconferencing, referred to by Florida statutes and rules as communications, media technology, or CMT. Now, the public is able to watch this meeting on Spectrum Channel 640, Frontier Channel 15, and on the internet at tampa.gov forward slash live stream. Now, Council, uh, I am going to ask the people on the second floor that to please remain um, uh, um, quiet, please, during the course of the meeting um, to allow the public to um, be able to um, speak freely and to be able to be heard during the course of the meeting. This is a, a very big workshop agenda, 
and members of the public uh, have had the opportunity to send in written comments by mail, by email, and also they do have the opportunity to speak remotely using CMT by pre-registering, and they, the instructions for that are on the uh, notice and on the City Council's webpage at tampa.gov forward slash City Council, one word. Now, for those individuals who don't have access to communications media technology or wish to come to City Hall in person, uh, they do have the opportunity to um, participate via CMT on the second floor of Old City Hall uh, during the hybrid live virtual meeting at 315 East Kennedy Boulevard. Again, it's the second floor, and please note that use of masks inside the building and social distancing is encouraged. Now, all written comments must be received no later than 24 hours prior to the meeting in order to be distributed timely to City Council and made part of the record, and that has been done. Council, I am going to ask for just a few variations on today's workshop agenda, particularly with regard to public comment. So this is for the benefit of the people on the second floor. This is for the benefit of the people who are online and registered to speak. And this is also for the benefit of those who are following the agenda. Now, what is going to happen is, again, this workshop has been put together um, with um, uh, land use dedicated to growth management and city planning related items. And uh, in a memo that you had received, it says to ensure the most efficient use of city council's time and consideration, the staff has asked, the staff has asked that their presentations be made first. And it has been broken down into the morning and the afternoon sessions. And I believe when we begin, uh, Ms. Post will actually uh, give again the roadmap. But the reason that I'm saying this now, Council, is because I'd like you to adopt the following rules with regard to public comment. With regard to the morning session items, which uh, you will hear discussed, the suggestion for public comment is to take the eight, I the eight um, individuals who have been registered take those comments following the staff presentations. Now this is different than the way we have done it from the time we began virtual meetings. We've always taken the public comment first. In this case, the staff has made the, the, um, uh, the request and the recommendation that you hear and the public have the opportunity to hear the, the staff's full reports before the morning public comment. So then what'll happen is you'll take those people who have been online and waiting to speak virtually, and then you will take the people on the second floor, at which time you will break for the afternoon session. Again, the afternoon session has items where the staff would like to make their presentations first and then give the public the opportunity to speak after staff presentations. I hope that has been made clear to the public so there is no confusion. I have reviewed this with the clerk and I have reviewed this with the chair and the staff. And if there's any questions, we're happy to do that, uh, have those answered. But council, based on all of that, I'd like you to waive your rules and adopt the rules as set forth today uh, to conduct this workshop. Mr. Galskalko has motion to waive. Mr. Citro has second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right, we have a ceremonial uh, from Ms. Carol Post. I think Mr. Carlson is downstairs, sir. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. And thank you to everyone for allowing us to do this special commendation today usually we're, now we're putting commendation on a commendation day but this is kind of a special one that we thought we would do now um, i met uh, carol post years ago when we were working together at usf on strategic planning and i saw her brilliance and her experience then um, she's from tampa but uh, worked in new york under mayor bloomberg and has lots of other great experience including some of the most important things that have happened at usf usf uh, loaned her to the mayor um, to uh, be the chair of the mayor's transition committee and she really is, is probably more than anybody other than the mayor, uh, the architect for uh, the, all the positive changes that have happened in the city in the last three years. Uh, she put together committees to listen to the public. She helped find the great, uh, talented senior management we have and, and worked on processes. And then uh, I think we were all very excited a year or so ago that uh, USF decided to loan her to us to help uh, uh, build, rebuild the economic development real estate portfolio, which she's done expertly. And it's been a, a great opportunity working with her, and I'm sure we're all going to uh, enjoy working with her um, in her new role at USF, which she can tell you about. 
But quickly, I just wanted to read this. Um, the Tampa City Council wishes to award this accommodation to Carol Post with gratitude for her service to the city of Tampa in her role as administrator for development and economic opportunity. Carol joined the city of Tampa team in early 2020 with the goal of modernizing many departmental programs, processes, and services. Despite many unique obstacles facing the city due to COVID-19, Carol is credited with implementing key initiatives such as the streamlining of the permitting process, which serves 20,000 applicants per year. Thanks to Carol's efforts, the city has the new city planning department and looks forward to the uh, Tampa Convention Center expansion. Uh, though her time with the city was brief, Carol's impact on her department and all the departments really of the city of Tampa will be appreciated for years to come. So thank you very much, Carol. You wanna say something? Uh, thank you, Councilman Carlson and uh, chair members of the council and, and to the public and certainly to my team behind me. I am. Um, I'm humbled by this. I, I have had such a unique opportunity to join the city, to serve the citizens of Tampa, um, and really to help make some small difference in uh, the progress that the city will make. Uh, I definitely would like to recognize Mayor Jane Castor for affording me the opportunity, giving me that support, and also to members of the council. You've been behind us every step of the way. We've made a lot of changes. Um, I, I believe there are more to come. We are an, a never-ending uh, chain of progress, um, but all progress and any success that we've had is certainly attributable to the, the uh, hundreds of people that support me. Um, a small representation is standing behind me, but this is a group of incredible talent that serves the city every day in extraordinary ways. So I've been honored to be a small part of it. I appreciate this opportunity. I appreciate this commendation very, very much and look forward to watching from the sidelines uh, up north at USF and watching the, the continued progress that the city will make. I'm very, very proud to have been a member of the city um, and will take that, uh, take that uh, with me forever. Appreciate it very much and look forward to continuing to uh, see you all in the future. Again, thank you, appreciate it. <coughs> Mr. Bier? Yes, sir. Um, just thank you for all of your hard work. And, um, you know, I, I, you're certainly a, a person who I admire for your professionalism, your uh, grace under pressure, your grace under fire, uh, so to speak. And I think you've done uh, a marvelous job. And, uh, you know, I, I've communicated my sentiments to you on your time uh, here in the city of Tampa throughout many conversations, which I hereby incorporate into my remarks um, and whatnot. And I, and I uh, just think that we're very, very fortunate to have you, uh, not just in the city of Tampa government, but just in the Tampa area. And, and, you're, uh, and you're always a class act. I, I remember uh, when you came out with us to Timber Falls apartment, uh, apartments after we read about the deplorable conditions out there in the Tampa Bay Times, um, and you were talking to residents and um, you, you displayed uh, just what I saw in your demeanor and in your words and in your actions, really a, a, an outrage at what you saw, uh, but also such uh, just humanitarian compassion that, that is so consistent with your public service. So again, just thank you for your demeanor and, uh, and just your uh, uh, general way about yourself. Thank you. Mr. Scalpi, recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we are certainly grateful um, to have the opportunity to work with you these past few years. And I know this community is um, as well. Uh, we were very lucky that you joined uh, the team here and the, the city of Tampa family because as Councilman Carlson already mentioned, so much progress was made and the impact that you made on our community and on our city, um, we will feel those, uh, we will reap those rewards for a long time to come. So we thank you for uh, your expertise, your knowledge, your wisdom, and your leadership. And um, good luck and best of luck on whatever you do uh, now. But uh, we did go to speak before the meeting. I know you will be staying local, so we appreciate that you're you're here. We still have you here. Thank you very much. Mr. you recognize sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Post, I thank you for being part of the city of Tampa family. I thank you for all the work that you have done. And I know that you will not be going far. And I look forward to working with you in the reconnect that we're going to have with our university that is the greatest place for resources and brilliant minds that can come back to work with this city. Ms. Post, thank you very much. 
Randy, you recognize Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Carol, I just want to say thank you for being here for a very short time, and you've done a yeoman's work like you've been here 10, 15, 20 years. Not that you've gotten any older, but uh, the work that you've done has been uh, a yeoman's work, and, and what you've done in a short period of time usually takes three or four times the amount of time for someone else to do. We're really appreciative of everything you've done. Congratulations, and you only be not too far up north, and uh, we know how to reach you. Thank you very much for all you've done. Well, Ms. Post, we are uh, sad to see you leave, but like I always tell people, you know, um, don't say what you can do, what you can do. You did that. Uh, multiple times this council has asked you to do something, and uh, we came back with answers. You came back with answers to be able to help us foster a better relationship and to be able to give the services that the community has been asking for. So all we can say is thank you. Thank you, thank you, and we wish you best wishes on your new endeavors. Mr. Carlson, thank you this morning, sir. Thank you. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you, All right, we'll make till Mr. Carlson comes back up. And we'll get on to. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Not to, not to start any problems, but if there are people that are already here that wanted to speak on items that are going to be taken up later in the uh, agenda, and I know a lot of people have to get back to work and whatnot, can we just let them? I don't, I don't think it's a huge crowd on the second floor. I think it's about eight, I think it's about eight people. Eight people. For, uh, yeah, I mean, if they're, you know, uh, they, they make time to come here and whatnot. Thank you, sir. As I was coming back up, um, uh, Machesna gave me a note and several folks asked me to, for us to reconsider the order of the, um, the order of public uh, comment today. So I just want, I promised I would pass that on and let me do that. Mr. Chairman? I'm going to ask if you can just to give that note to the clerk just in case there's any quote you do. Okay. Read, it into the, read it into the record. Read into the record? Read it into the record. It's about eight, I think eight, eight, about eight downstairs, Ms. Poe. So uh, if it's about eight downstairs, uh, I know you asked, but if we got eight people to speak, I, I would prefer to get those eight out of the way. Chairman, we and we'll move uh, on. We don't, we don't object. All right. Thank you. Chairman. Go ahead and read it. It was posted. Read it into the record, and we'll go ahead and uh, make, make some amendments to these to the order of business. Okay. This is from the handout from Tony Daniels. We sent a petition upstairs requesting that the, I don't understand that word, it's spreading order, or not are, quite sure. I think it's we are opposed to uh, changing the public comment order, and you have possibly 10 people, 11 people on this list of paper here. Uh, so what we're going to do, we will, Mr. Miscanna-Scalco, if you make a motion, we'll reverse it back, Mr. Shelby, and go ahead and go with the public comment. What's council's pleasure? I then make a motion that the people that are downstairs, which we assume are Second. eight people or so, and that, um, do we have a lot of people registered online at this time? Five. How many are online, if we can? About five. Five, all right. Then the motion is to get this public comment about 13 people in total, I believe. All right, Mr. Mescalco, second Mr. Mr. Uh, Memorandum? Yes, sir. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. All right, Thank you, comment. Council. You want 
to do virtual first. Isn't that what you want? All right, we're going to go virtual. The clerk wants to do virtual first. We'll go virtual first. Good morning, Chair. The first speaker we have is Andrew Moore. However, I cannot unmute him, being that he needs to enter his pen. We will circle back to him once he gets that set up. The next speaker will be San Ms. Sandra Sanchez. Ms. Sanchez, if you can hear me, please unmute yourself. You have three minutes to speak. Again, Ms. Sanchez, if you can hear me, please unmute yourself. All right, we'll move on to Carol Ann Bennett. Ms. Bennett, if you can hear me, please unmute yourself. You have three minutes to speak. Hi, good morning, gentlemen. My name is Carol Ann Bennett. I'm a lifelong resident of Tampa. Um, I'm gonna make this short and sweet. Uh, there's a real problem in the city with design exceptions. Um, I've heard people from Tampa Heights, Seminole Heights, Davis Island, West Tampa, you name it, and every uh, area of the city seems to be having problems with design exceptions. What they are, in fact, are variances, but they're not treated as variances. Um, they're on a secret beltway, and they're underground, and uh, they need to be treated as variances. So would you please uh, look into this and see what we can do to bring these uh, design exceptions above ground so the neighbor and neighborhoods have some say so in um, how these things are approved. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Or, uh, thank you very much. Have a good day. All right. Thank or, you. Uh, Going thank back you to Ms. Sandra Sanchez. Ms. Sanchez, if you know me, you have three minutes. Oh, feedback. Sanchez. Can you hear me now? We got a lot of feedback. Uh, yes. Ms. Sanchez, could you turn down your um, audio in the background? Uh. Ms. Sanchez, you ready? Ms. Sanchez. Yes, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, my name is Sandy Sanchez, and I'm the president of the Army Garden Civic Association, Association and secretary to THAN. I applied to speak during public comment on a number of items. However, I realized by the time I listed these items, my three minutes would be up. At the last regular city council meeting, I asked you as a team to review the negative report by Christine Glover, Director of Internal Audit, Transmitting Audit Report, Development Coordination Planning Section, dated December 20th, 2021. It was a very negative report, and the report suggested standard operating procedures be established. Management's answer, they would have procedures in place by September 2023, 20 months away. This is unacceptable. This department is called the dark department by neighborhood leaders. This department makes decisions for design exceptions that need to be brought into the sunshine and neighborhoods need to be made aware of these design exceptions. Too many decisions are made behind closed doors. Please don't let this dark department continue as it is. I ask that you ask the variance review board to take these issues on a temporary basis so decisions can be made in the sunshine for all to see. And by the way, the staff report for today has a couple of errors. In the report, it states that city council made the decision for DE 1 21-250 at 2507 West North B, B Street. This is incorrect. This is the dark department's decision where twice it was denied and the third time it mysteriously was approved. This decision you made after the dark department group denied it twice because it was not compatible is DE 120 156 1709 West St. John. This is the file you overturned after the recommendation was made to deny. Also, the report that you requested for me in October asking about favoritism to domain homes has the wrong address. It is not 2428 West Cass. As soon as I noticed my typo in October, I immediately sent in a correction. 2423 West Cass is the correct address. 
I sent in the correction in October, yet it is not attached to this file as my other emails are. I will gladly volunteer for any committee that might discuss the frustrations of the neighborhood. You know, those folks that vote for you, I ask that you take these suggestions into consideration and allow the department to regroup and make the changes needed for all to see. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. Next speaker will be Ms. Stephanie Pointer. If you can hear me, please unmute yourself. You have three minutes to speak. Good morning, gentlemen. Morning. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm gonna make this short and sweet. You guys have a really hefty agenda. Um, item number two, the comprehensive plan. I'm very excited because I'm sick and tired of people saying I can't defend the current uh, comprehensive plan. We have already asked our folks to complete the surveys, the first set of surveys. Um, local roads, item number three, I, the point on West Shore, that's all I need to say. Um, I'll be happy to send this to you in writing because I, I don't see many folks writing anything down. Um, honestly, Number five, I wish that we had the AB issues in SOG. That would mean that businesses were coming down here. Uh, number eight, I'm so glad we're getting rid of PETAs and I think this is a perfect example. Um, the, I, I support the, the three amendment stuff that's been done by Mr. Pederica, but the rest of it, especially that downtown stuff, it is so convoluted. I read it last summer, 60 pages long. They've reduced it to 49 pages. I, I don't have time to read it now. Um, and I'm sure you guys don't either. Um, I think it needs to be tightened up to no more than five pages. Um, number 10, the West Tampa overlay is a product of the neighborhood committees, the CRA, not my beloved Sandy Sanchez. She didn't do it solo. I am sure that if Sandy were truly the queen that folks are implying that she is by, hand, by handing her out her phone number, the West Tampa would be a much better place. But alas, she's not. Everyone agreed to the plan so stick with it, please. Um, the design exceptions, notifications. I have some thoughts about some of the processes that Sandy brought up on item number 44 on February the 3rd from the internal audit department. As um, some of the SOPs are going to obviously need to be designed or revised, I have some comments as a end user. Um, and I think they would make everyone's life easier. Um, I'm very excited to watch this really heavy agenda today and um, good luck. Have a good day. Thank you. All right, next speaker we have is Ardesha Floyd. If you can hear me, please unmute yourself. You have three minutes to speak. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah okay, cool, <laughs> thanks. Hello everyone, my name is Ardesha Floyd. I was born and raised in Tampa. And I just wanted to call attention to our current housing crisis that's occurring right now. Um, due to a $200 rent increase a few months ago, I was forced to move almost outside of the city limits, the furthest out I've ever lived in Tampa. I could not afford rent anywhere else in Tampa, not in the usual places I have grown up in. And that's when I started thinking. Years ago, I remember my mom saying that they're moving all the black people out of Tampa. And only now, now do I see firsthand the spoils of the labor the city has been doing for the past years. In the midst of this housing crisis, where rent has increased by 24%, where people spend on average 42% of their income on rent, the city of Tampa is closing down housing projects, which means the black people who have lived there for years will have to relocate to a different part of town where rent has certainly increased or be forced outside of the city limits. This is exactly what my mom all those years ago. Spending nearly 30% of my income on rent means I and other members of my community struggle to meet our other basic needs like food, clothes, and don't even get me started on healthcare. In the state of Florida, this is what affordable gets you. Affordable is not enough. Rezoning is not enough. Rental assistance is not enough. This is a housing emergency, a crisis that calls for a fundamental changing of how we meet people's needs. So stop fooling yourselves. The very least the city council can do is what is very much in your power, which is declaring a housing emergency and demand a rent control ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. 
All right, Chair, we had two other people register to speak, Mr. Prieto and Misha Robson. However, they did not log on at this time. And Mr. Andrew Moore is still having technical difficulties. Um, if we would like to circle back after in person, that's up to you. Just let me know. All right, we're moving on right now. We've got speakers downstairs and we've got a tight agenda, so we're moving on at this point. Uh, second floor. Hello. Morning, sir. Hi. And I am sorry that's my king holder in the chorus, America, Johnny, J-O-H-N-N-I-E, Yahweh, Yahim, Sai. saying so state must have a note from the people saying it gave it willingly power over the okay without NATO permission if state is moving without supervision of what you call citizen what we call people of whom state a citizen must monitor you at all costs. Final notice. Executed right away. King Yahweh, Yahya. Alpha Pi Alpha. Sovereign Worldwide Global American Kingdom, Johnny Law, Uniform Commercial Code 1-308, Johnny Law, USA. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, sir. My comments. Next speaker. Pico. Well, you know, we already announced this anyway on the Worldwide News and Everything. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. I hot. You look like got there. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. I'm not the speaker. I'm the announcer. And you need to comprehend, you do not run this show. Next speaker, Jack. Tell him on the day I become a speaker, then he can keep pretending to govern. Pretender. Fake one. And guess what? We already permanently got rid of your fake corporation. So get your state behind out of here. Is this yours, Johnny? Yeah. Okay. Uh, he always lawfully agreed to let the real public 
public speak and then violates what he says. He's always saying this. Well. If you state your name, ma'am, you can begin any time. Good morning. My name is Kathleen Ribby. Um, this will be very brief. Um, there is a housing crisis, and I really am shouting out for help. Um, I lived in Tampa, New Tampa right now, in Tampa for 20 years total. Um, I'm in New Tampa. It's been eight years, and I live here at the park at Cross Creek um, for eight solid years. I am a faithful and devoted uh, resident. I've never paid my rents late. Um, I cooperate with the noise audience, and um, this is what I am paying now, uh, $12.45. And um, when I came home a few weeks ago, this is the notice from the park at Cross Creek, the renewal. Um, to up over $500. Um, when I came home that day after a hard day of work, seeing that my rent was going to be going up $500 um, in the New Tampa area, um, I enjoy my community, I enjoy my side of town, but I have nowhere to go. Once this goes up, um, I'm very upset about it emotionally. I have nowhere to go. I can't afford a home. Um, at this time, so um, I'm just shouting out for help, and this is definitely a crisis for everybody, um, and I'm just here to fight. I thank you for your time, thank and you I hope you guys help us. Thank you. screens are blank up here on the dais. Good morning, Connie, Good morning. Connie Burton. Who didn't know this day would come? Who did not know this day was, would come when we have been shouting the alarm that there was a housing crisis? But when we said it, maybe it was because of what you knew the victims would be then. As you continue to go about sanitizing certain parts of this city, I have watched the last previous administration, this administration, I listened to the transition team of this administration that understood that we was in a crisis. And so what we have seen and what you are applauding this morning is that Tampa now has this over blossom, unrealistic rent that normal working class people cannot afford. And it seemed to be, well, it's the market and there's nothing we could do about it. Well, there is something you could do about it, but it take courage. It take the kind of courage that we have not seen of late. Let's say that we're going to use every a piece of available city land to build a affordable product for working class people. And even if you don't want to say for black people, and even if you don't want to say for working people with inside the city limits, say that we need to keep a cast and a class of people here, excuse me, that can do the day to day work. It is awful. It is appalling. There are a number of cities that have taken the type of necessary courage that will allow for all of us to live together. We have watched you council persons that have been around when Domain Homes came along and you found land for them. And again, the product that they build is not affordable for working class people. Tampa has become the new South Africa of the state of Florida. 
the removal and existing of black people through your shell game of saying that we can still see you is not enough. We have put in labor in this city and we are demanding that you focus on beyond words, beyond a workshop, but with direct action and declaring that you're going to provide a product that Mrs. Post talked about when the mayor transitioned into the uh, office of the mayor, that we have a housing product that working class people can afford and that we see the existence of black people remaining in the city of Tampa. Morning, Mentez not Tampa, Florida. You know the police kill black people in camera and they say, hey, they've got on body cams, they've got dash cam and they keep doing it. Why they keep doing it? They should know better. No compassion. Well, they keep doing it because it's worth it. It's worth the intimidation that it showed a fear that it puts in the African people internationally, not just in that city, internationally. So what happens is, it's the same thing that happens right in the city council week after week. And the city attorney, they need to just get rid of him. The man that's sitting up there, they just need to fire him. No respect for the people. Absolutely, positively, no respect for the people. And week after week now, they've become arrogant about pulling the nonsense from working class people, some homeless people, some people that's struggling, that takes the time to come down here, and they put other people before them. That's disrespectful. It's disrespectful. And the people that the people elect to represent them shouldn't allow this. And they're all attorneys or they're all in politics, but they're allowing it. But the fact of the matter is people are trying to have an effect on the rent increase. You're not going to have an effect on the rent increase because until you're willing to have an effect on capitalism, until you're willing to have an effect on capitalism, until you can be a proud socialist or a proud communist, or pr proud anarchist, or say, hey, I'm down with Black Lives Matter, or Antifa, or whatsoever. Until you're willing to stand up to the system, you're not going to, you can't stop capitalism. Slavery couldn't stop capitalism. They just build upon it. Okay? And right now, the way it is, you, uh, the people don't, you can't say gay. <laughs> okay? That's how serious they're getting against poor and working class people, against people that's marginalized. It's a lot of things you can't say. You can't say reparations. You can't say housing commission. You can't say work for the interests of the poor and working class people. It's a lot of things that's going on. But the fact of the matter is, people are being disrespected in all ways. If it's in the area of education, housing, uh, the environment, whatsoever it is. Poor and working class people are being disrespected. And you see it's happening right here in this city council. Week after week, you see it. You see it with the budgets they put forth. You see it with the bicycle stops. You see it with the things that goes on. You see it with the fact that it's thousands of African people right from this city is sitting in prison, in prison, not in jail, for marijuana usage or marijuana sales, but they got marijuana manufacturing plants right inside the black community. You've got to review life. And you've got to be serious about life and where you want to go with that. And you can't keep disrespecting the people that's hateful. Thank you, sir. to talk about the housing crisis here in Tampa. I have not lived in Tampa here for very long, but I have lived in Florida all my life. Uh, speak for my personal experience, uh, very recently, 
my lease ended and a group of friends and I were looking for housing in Tampa for months. After many rejections, many lost application fees, rejections based on credit despite having decent credit, rejections based on not having long enough credit history even though we weren't alive long enough to have enough credit history. Uh, we eventually managed to find a place only because we agreed to put up six months rent in advance. We were very lucky to be able to scrounge up our savings to afford this, but this story is the lucky story. Um, it is so much worse for so many more people here in Tampa, especially those in black communities here in Tampa, like Robles Park Village. People in Robles Park Village are going to be moved out because of development in the area, and they need to have some place to go. They can't just be forced out of Tampa when they've lived here for decades. So I'm coming here to talk to you today about my experiences, but it's so much more beyond just one person who was able to get out of work. There are many people here today who could not, who were lucky like me, but we still want to advocate for those who weren't able to be here, who will be so much more affected. Because I might have been homeless for two weeks, but there are people who might not be able to find houses again. This is a crisis. It's been a crisis for months, and it's time for the city council to take action. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Lynn Myers. I live in zip code 33629, and I've been a resident of Tampa for approximately 35 years. Um, I have seen in that time a continual increase in the cost of housing uh, and uh, rent uh, along with that, along with mortgages and the price of housing. Um, I'm spurred recently to come here because I have a daughter who recently graduated from college with her bachelor's. Uh, she has a job, but she can't afford to, have, uh, to move out and live on her own. Even with an, a roommate or even two roommates, she can't afford it. And I see it not just for her, but for her friends, many of her friends, and of course throughout the community. Uh, it's also incredible to me that within the past year, in 2021, rent in this area has increased 24%, the largest increase in the entire country. Um, shelter, along with food and water, is a basic necessity for all human beings, but it is no longer uh, possible for so many people who live in our community. And so I'm here because um, something needs to be done in Tampa, throughout our area, um, throughout the country, of course, as well. But uh, for here in Tampa, it's our job, it's your job to do something about this. Um, it is a true state of emergency for us. And I noticed that on a workshop agenda for later today, uh, there's a discussion about uh, the legal department to research about, uh, other cities uh, regarding rent control. And the verbiage here says to create a possible rent stabilization plan. No, not possible. It's needed and it's necessary. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mia. Let me say something. Uh, I, I know that we had probably nine speakers that were already down there this morning. And the rent stabilization, uh, we had multiple calls letting the public know that it, the rent stabilization will be done at 1.30. We have a huge agenda that has a lot of growth management stuff that deals with a lot of things this morning. So I know people are continuing to come in, come in, but at some point I have to cut it off as the chairman. So I, I'm going to ask those that are down there how many that are actually down there now, and I'm about to cut it off. And if they're here about rent stabilization, rent stabilization is at 1.30. That's where we're going to take up rent stabilization. That's the appropriate time to handle that. We know it is a crisis here. This council is aware of that. And we're going to deal with those issues at 1.30.
But if you're here to speak on about the growth management issues, we refer those speakers to speak now, and we can deal with the growth management, uh, the uh, great stimulation this afternoon. But those who are already here first about rent, I'll hear those out, but the rest will have to hear at 1.30. And I apologize, but we'll give everybody an opportunity to speak later this afternoon. Next speaker. Do we have any more speakers? Yeah, it's too far away. Exactly. Thank you. Oh, if you state your name, begin speaking, ma'am. Hi, my name is Lauren Adriansen. I live in South Seminole Heights. I've been a homeowner there for the last eight or 10 years. For over half of that time, I've had a roommate because my friends can't afford to live in this city. It's getting worse, not better, and it's increasingly bad to watch my friends go through and try to figure out how to pay up to 50% of their rent, of their household income, going straight into rent. We need a solution to this. If, if you're not willing to, and you don't have the will to go ahead and declare what this is, which is a housing crisis, and it's a state of emergency, and we need rent control, then I urge you, this isn't a possible rent stabilization, as Lynn before me said. This is a need. Find as many avenues as possible to deal with these people's problems. It is scary to think about the number of working people in Tampa who will not be able to afford a roof over their heads and who already can't. That's not fair. Also, please go ahead and get rid of the noise ordinance in Ebor. I would really encourage that for later on. Thank you. Folks, are, everyone on the phone is gone already. Uh, just for the public eye, we know the, the camera is on me and Mr. Miranda. Uh, Mr. Vieira is here, and also Mr. Maniscalco there on the side, and the camera doesn't get that shot. We do have some council members out, but they will be back. Uh, we had a ceremony for Mr. Tokley this morning at our Port of the Creek. We wish we all could have gone, which he was a mentor of mine, but we all couldn't go because this is a very important to hear these items. But a few council members have, have, are out, and one council member is out. So uh, again, those councilmen will be coming back probably about 30, 40 minutes, but we do have a quorum for the public to know. Yes, ma'am, Madam Clerk. Let's finish, let's go ahead and finish downstairs. And we already started downstairs, he'll have to wait now. No, I think we have more. Lisa, we have any more, Ms. Evans, we have any more downstairs? Let's get those folks lined up, and also we can have the sanitizer person be a little bit closer so we can kind of speed things up, please, if you don't mind. Yes, we have about eight or nine more people down here to speak. All right, that's all we're going to take. If it's, if it's pertaining to rent stabilization, the rest we'll have to do this afternoon at 1.30. Okay. Right. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Morning. Good morning. My name is Angel D'Angelo, born and raised in Tampa, and it's looking like... Tampa or Hillsborough County at large will not be a place for me much longer with these rent increases. My rent personally went up $300 a month, and that's asinine. I don't see how you can expect anyone to be able to afford their rent and also use the goods and services. The impact this would have on the local economy wouldn't even be good. I can't support local restaurants or go to music festivals or do any of the, quote, fun things that this city has to offer and enjoy if I can't afford my rent and I have to get multiple jobs to pay it and that's where we're getting at. I understand you all have this agenda and you have other things to do. There is nothing more important than human rights. So the fact that you're even trying to push us out to 130, we have working jobs we have to go to to pay for this rent crisis. You need to put in rent control now. You need to declare a housing state of emergency now. 
and you need to be uh, bold and courageous. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. A city's leadership that does not stand up for its most vulnerable people is soulless. And I don't want to believe that you are all soulless, but if you are not going to take this as the most important issue of your time, of your service, then what are you even doing? You should be embarrassed of yourselves if you do not take swift action now when you have the power. This will be your legacy in life and in history. And don't disappoint your legacy because honestly, with the way we run this city and this police department, it's already pretty embarrassing, so don't make it worse. We need to make housing a priority. We need to defund the police and refund the community, repel the noise ordinance, and we need to do what's right for the people of Tampa. Also, we need to solve the murder of transgender Latina Jenny DeLeon, murdered in November, still unsolved. So what are we paying the police department for if they can't even solve a murder of a vulnerable person? Thank you. Thank you, sir. You may begin speaking, state your name, sir. Thank you, my name is Joseph Nahava. Uh, members of the city council, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on this uh, rent control, rent stabilization ordinance. Um, I'm sure you're well aware that rents have skyrocketed astronomically in the past few years, um, while wages have remained largely stagnant, creating nothing but a crisis situation for working class folks. I know this because I come uh, on behalf not only of myself, but as a mental health practitioner in this city who has a large number of clients struggling with astronomical rents, um, this can leave people in a situation of having to remain in unhealthy or even dangerous living situations for lack of better options. And while there may be some uh, resources there, definitely insufficient, uh, not even close to being able to meet the needs of the people. Um, you may hear testimony or may have heard uh, testimony about how uh, astronomical rent increases are not price gouging. Well, it's interesting that rent control now is in the same position that minimum wage used to be, right? Thought of as a simple supply and demand issue that if wages go up, employment would go down. And that's obviously not true, right? <coughs> um, this has not been borne out, and the research conclusively supports the idea that rent control has no effect on development or housing availability, but is effective in keeping people in their homes protected from rent increases that have nothing to do with anything the landlord does to the property and keeping neighborhoods uh, stable. I would also like to make, take this opportunity to make special mention of the situation in Robles Park Village, a predominantly African-American neighborhood uh, that is being uh, torn down and redeveloped. Um, the people there should be given a guaranteed place to stay as the development is being constructed in the same neighborhood that they live in now to minimize disruption and should be given the opportunity to have a guaranteed spot to live in in the new development should they want it, as would only be fair and just. <clears throat> Don't let this opportunity to make a real difference in this solving this crisis slip through your fingers. Allow the people to vote on a rent stabilization ordinance. Give them the democracy that they need and don't let the residents of Global Spark Village end up on the street. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Arias Johnson. I live in Hyde Park. Um, I'm here today, today to demand that the city of Tampa declare a housing state of emergency for rent control. For over a year, I have been washing clothes for people who are experiencing homelessness, and I have seen the way this city and the so-called law enforcement officers treat our most vulnerable citizens. And I will point out, as others have before me, that this is predominantly um, black and indigenous people who are um, treated this way. I have spoken with people who have been arrested or threatened with arrest for simply trying to find a place to sleep, 
as if they are there by choice, as if they really want to be huddled up on a park bench or a bus stop to rest. And I hope I don't need to remind you of the years that the heart benches were removed from the bus stops at Tampa PD's request. I know that the goal is to hide the homeless population from the rest of the citizens in tent cities and in jails to, quote, clean the streets and make the problem of homelessness invisible. But for those of us who pay attention, we know it's getting worse. And if the rents continue to get up, to go up, there will only be more unhoused people in this city. The Tampa Hope tent city will need to expand to fit the growing unhoused populations, while homes that are currently selling for cash at astronomical prices will be turned into Airbnbs and sit empty for weeks or months at a time. When you sell access to housing to the highest bidder, you make it clear that only certain people deserve to survive, that only certain people are allowed to have housing. Well, I challenge that. I know that housing is a human right, and I know that the housing shortage is a myth. We don't need more luxury apartment buildings or more new homes, not until every home or apartment that's currently sitting empty gets filled. This is why I'm demanding that you let people stay in their homes. We are in a housing crisis, a housing state of emergency, and we need rent control immediately. Thank you. My name is Junior Jack Tapura. I'm the General Secretary for the Central Committee of Tampa Funa Bombs. I'm here because I made a commitment to the people of our People's Council to speak. I know you're my enemy, as well as the pigs. I'm not confused. But I know that the city government, the state government, and the federal government are there to create confusion and to repress uh, for the benefit of the people who benefit from our exploitation, the working people's exploitation. The city government, and as I said, the state government and the federal government is unwilling and unable to meet the needs of the people. They violated our human rights. Some of these human rights Violations include the violation of the human rights of housing, food, transportation, employment, among others. There's a contradiction between what the needs of the people are and what the desires of the big businesses, big landlords, the big banks, and the government from the city to the federal. We're in a phase of fascism where it is in power and securely so. This means that the people are allowed to protest and criticize because we are not an actual threat to the power of the fascists in control. When the people organize our power to guarantee our human rights, we will not be allowed to speak or protest. Their oppression will be clear. I urge the people listening to join an organization or start an organization to use our collective power to guarantee our liberation. All power to the people Death to fascism, freedom to the people. Hello? You can begin, Pastor. Okay. State your name. My name is Pastor Frank William, located 1112 East Scott Street, Tampa, Florida, Paradise Missionary Baptist Church. I first want to read some scripture to you. It's 2 Chronicles 7, 13, and 14. God said this, If I shall shut up heaven, that there shall be no more rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or uh, if I send pestilence among my people. But if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and turn 
from and seek my face and turn from their wicked way. Then I will hear from heaven and will heal the land. I thank God for this word. Since I'm a preacher, I try to preach the truth. You know, we come here week after week after week trying to get something done, but nobody seemed to hear us. And I'm trying to request that y'all need to, if y'all not going to do nothing for us, send the mail down here. Maybe, just maybe, she will hear what we got to say. But even if she don't hear us that what she got, what got, what we got to say, then send the governor down here, and maybe he'll hear what we got to say. But we got to be heard one way or another. We come down here week after week. Nobody seem to hear. Nobody wants to hear. And it seems like don't nobody give a damn about us. But we got to speak up regardless of whether they want to hear us or not. And let them know how we feel. Tell the truth about everything. And don't, call, don't just look at the color of people's skin. Try to help all, all people regardless of what their race, gender, or their nationality. We all need help. We living in the United States of America, we don't care about certain people. And when you talk about affordable housing, I need affordable housing. I can't afford my, my mortgage like I used to no more because they go up, 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 up. Keep going up and they don't care. They don't care whether we hit the streets or not. And got so many people out there homeless in the street and they don't care nothing about it. And they took a lot of the buses off the land because people had found out to make that their home. You get a pass to ride the bus all day long. But we don't give a damn about people no more. But we should care. And I want to ask her to do something for me. Bring the mail down here and see if she'll hear what we got to say. And if she don't hear, then get the governor down here. Maybe he'll hear. Somebody got to hear. Thank God. Thank you. Thank you, people. Pastor. Hello, my name is Ryland Eston Molina. That's Eston like Aston, but with an E. Um, I didn't prepare a speech for this. I wanted to go into this as organically as possible because I'm human, just like everyone else you heard today. Um, I just moved out about a year ago. Um, I love my parents to death, but unfortunately I had to be homeless. Um, I was fortunate enough to get into ACTS on Nebraska. It's a homeless shelter, and they only accepted me because of my age. Um, I watched a lot of different people come and go from different backgrounds because they can't afford to live anywhere. Um, now I live in, near NoHo. Um, Rent prices are going up hundreds and hundreds of dollars, and all of my Uber drivers are like, <laughs> this used to be the ghetto. So I think about that when I lay my head at night, that I am sleeping on top of land where multiple families have been displaced. Um, I walk outside, I see a field, of demolished houses, I saw a giant stuffed animal. And um, I know that I'm not a person to you, that I'm just part of this muddled mess because you're desensitized to this. But you can't, you can't run from this. Because you could try to push it to 130. You could try to push it for next month. But these people are in real situations that are dire right now. You can't put a time on that. There's no schedule for that. I've been working overtime for years.
Well, fight, fight, fight. Housing is a human right. Young man, young man, young man, young man, young man, come back to the podium. Yes, sir? You are a person. So they said you are a person. It took you a lot of courage to come down and get in front of that mic as a young person. So you are a person. We appreciate you coming down. Thank you. God Thank bless you. you. All right. All right, uh, good morning, City Council. Uh, my name is Harrison Lundy. Um, I am a resident in Hillsborough County, and I just wanna say that I uh, stand before this body uh, as upset and as angry as all the people that we talk to about the inhumanity about what's not going on on the part of the City Council. You know, we've been on the ground for months. We've been online for months, trying to at least make people aware of what is happening to the tenants in Tampa. Um, but I'm also kind of confused because I hear a lot of talk about, you know, like how good Tampa is, how we're like the best city in Florida. But I just like, I just have a few questions. Um, <laughs> why does the best city in Florida allow its tenants to lie homeless on the street? Why does the best city in Florida dramatically and unjustly increase rent through exploited loopholes? How do the leaders of the best city in Florida, how does the city council have the stomach to watch all of this happen? How do they have the stomach to watch our lives in jeopardy and come out of these meetings with nothing? These are things we hear all the time from folks that we talk to for, again, the last several months. We hear the need for more than just research on other cities. We hear the need for an eviction moratorium. We see how people struggle financially to get food on the table and have to sacrifice their health care or their uh, health care, basic human rights, food, schooling, we see people sacrifice all of that just to keep a roof over their head. And I know a fact that everybody on this council would hear it too if they just showed up to the meetings or they just showed up to these places where they can hear these tenants' stories. All I see is people chilling in this room, in this council, or in your own housing where these issues don't truly touch you. So I just have to ask, how convenient is that? I would hate to leave this um, topic that centers rent control, I would hate to leave this with no actual plan to control the rent. I would hate for our time to be wasted again by hearing nothing but lip service because we need this held down and under control. And it truly does show that nobody on this council truly comes to the meetings because I have yet to see it, the people I work with have yet to see it, and this is an issue that cannot wait until 1.30, cannot wait until next week or next month, this needs to be dealt with right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Hello, City Council. My name is Tatiana Morales. I, am a, I live in Uptown near USF, and I come to you as one of the 44% of Tampa residents that are renters. I'm here supporting a rent control ordinance, but I'm supporting much more than that. Tampa as, is now what, considered one of the hottest cities in the country when half of our communities don't have sidewalks, when there are homeless people begging on the streets for basic human resources. And what do we do? We ignore them, we over-police them, we harass them, we move them constantly without actually taking a moment to address the problems that created this. Address the fact that most communities are becoming Airbnbs because people have no other financial safety nets that they're giving up their shelter in the hope for slight financial profit. And we have so many landlords, including mine, that when I moved in, my rent was $1,100. And right now, my unit is on the market for $1,800 without any changes in quality or service, with actually reduced quality of amenities because of the pandemic we are currently in. And I, I don't blame them for that, but I do blame them for the obscene rent change. There has not been a drastic increase of wages in Florida. There's not been a drastic increase of wages in the United States. People are poorer than ever. I know I spend a majority of my income paying rent every single month, just thinking, huh, maybe one day I'll pay off my student loans. Maybe one day I'll get to actually own a home in this community that I love and live in. And when you say there aren't solutions and when the city council presents to you, they're 22, when the city, when the legal team presents their 22 page document saying, oh no, it's too hard and scary to actually address rent control. 
No, it's because it's an important enough problem that we need to address. And if they're not gonna do rent control, fine, let's move to the next thing. An eviction defense fund. Let's regulate the limits of application fees. Let's initiate deposit maximums. Let's plan inclusionary zoning. Let's actually invest in community land trusts. Let's actually get a tenant's right to counsel. Maybe good cause evictions like there's an Albany being passed. Or in Seattle where they require that the landlords pay 10% of a down payment to relocate someone to disincentivize the landlords from relocating people in 30 days like what's happening to Holly Court. Holly Court, the only reason they are actually being able to have a house in a place like Holly Court where there was black mold on the walls and the water was tainted. There are so many issues in the city of Tampa that we need to address and there are so many solutions. And the solutions start with this moment right now, listening to the constituents that are telling you to demand more. This isn't just a rent control situation, this is a housing crisis. And until we have major housing reform, the crisis will only get worse. As every single person adds up on the street and on the sidewalks, the community will be more agitated because they are seeing people begging for basic human rights. We need to do more. We need to increase the amounts for the vouchers at Robles Park or guarantee that they are getting housing and not tear down 400 units of valuable housing for, for residents where there is no more in the area. We have to do more and we have to do better for the citizens of this community because the developers and the management companies, they don't define a city. It's the people that define a city. And when you kick out the working class, the poor class, the black and brown and indigenous folks that have lived here their whole lives, they will remember that and the soul of this city that is built on the workers working together, passing interracial lines and defending the community they love. Thank you. Also, there are no cops wearing masks and there's a pandemic happening right now. Our officers that are public servants should be wearing masks. Good morning, Council. My comments will be a little bit brief today. Um, cities throughout history have faced moments of crisis that have changed them forever. Tampa is facing one of those moments today. Your name, sir? Oh, sorry, my name is Nathan Hagen, and I represent UB Tampa. We are already here. Our neighbors are already in crisis. Our city has already changed. What is the choice is how you choose to deal with it. Many people are here to talk about the solution to our short-term crisis. We are in an emergency, and we should declare one and mobilize to address it. I want to speak also to the rest of your content today, which is focused around long-term solutions. The mayor talks about 10,000 units that need to be built in the next couple of years. We need to be talking about 200,000. We need wholesale reform of our comprehensive plan this year. It's impossible to do much to address our emergency. It's impossible to do too much to address our emergency. We need reforms that meet the challenges of today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hi, my name's Carla Correa, and I'm a tenant union organizer here in the Tampa Bay area in both St. Pete and Tampa. Um, I've been organizing since August of 2020, and in that time, I've seen all types of people slip into permanent housing, seemingly permanent housing instability or homelessness due to these rapidly rising rents. Since the start of the pandemic, Almost 24,000 evictions have been filed here in the Tampa Bay area. And even that shocking number does not tell the entire story. That number doesn't account for situations like Holly Court, where tenants were told they simply had to leave, and some of them left before any evictions were filed. People all over Tampa are being told they either have to pay an additional $200, $300, sometimes $500 or more, or get out. And paying up can mean foregoing you know, food, like necessities, like food and toiletries, which should be guaranteed to all as human rights. And some people are just self-evicting and being pushed into areas further away from their current jobs, doctors, kids, schools. It's very disruptive, it's very violent, and it's time for Tampa's so-called leaders to have the political will to pass a housing state of emergency and let the people of Tampa vote on rent control. What we need now is a stop to the evictions, a stop to the rent increases, and a housing guarantee for all residents in Tampa. Maybe a state of emergency is risky, and maybe it will open the door to lawsuits, but that's what we need. That's what we need right now. 
now. We can't continue down the path of, you know, housing solutions that only serve the po to, to, to line the pockets of landlords, investors, developers. It's time to take a stand for the people of Tampa no matter what risk. You know, if landlords are not reined in, Tampa residents will continue to go, to go homeless. This, this is violence that you, the Tampa City Council, has the power to stop. The only people who don't support rent control are the actors that I just mentioned, realtors, uh, landlords, developers, investors. It's time to put the working people of Tampa first, the people who make the city run, because we're the real people who have the power in this city, and we could shut this city down if we wanted to. If you're a Tampa tenant listening and you want to join the fight, please look up Tampa Tenants Union on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Get involved in the fight for housing justice. You know, we're not going to stop until we have rent control in this city. We're not going to stop until we have guaranteed housing for all in this city. And that's something the Tampa City Council needs to get started on right now. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, there's no one, no more people down here for public comment. Thank you, Ms. Evers. Thank you for all your hard work this morning. Thank you so much. All right, Ms. Post. All right, that's Andrew Moore. Good morning, Chair. I have Mr. Andrew Moore available. Mr. Moore, if you can hear me, please unmute yourself. You have three minutes to speak. Hello, Council. Thank you for uh, allowing me to speak to you today. Um, I wanted to make a comment from our neighborhood. My, uh, I'm in the Bowman Heights neighborhood. And you guys are taking up it's item number eight, it's 130 regarding uh, uh, changes to the existing. Um, let me make sure I get this right. It's changes to, the, to some of the existing ordinances that are on the books. The ones that our neighborhood are particularly interested in are the definitions for commercial equipment, as well as vehicle parking in residential neighborhoods. Um, we're in support of the changes that are listed in the agenda. Um, this is a redefinition of the commercial of the definition for commercial uh, equipment and um, our neighborhood has had has been plagued by an ongoing crisis caused by a local business that thinks that they can fill our neighborhood with their commercial trucks and with their employees and can take advantage and overrun the entire neighborhood with their vehicles and, and staff. And uh, it's really become an eyesore for our neighborhood. It's unfair that the hardworking people of Bowman Heights uh, have to put up with this. And, and while we're happy that the, the commercial business is successful, um, we don't think it's right that they come in and, and trounce our neighborhood and fill it full of commercial vehicles. Um, especially when this commercial establishment many times has tried to take advantage of the neighborhood. Um, and, and each time that they've tried to take advantage of the neighborhood, the city council has voted against what, what the business wanted to do and said it's not appropriate. And, it, and, in, and in return and in retribution, they fill our neighborhood full of their commercial traffic because they didn't get what they wanted. Correcting the ordinances here today will not allow them to do that anymore and to, and to, to, to basically take revenge on our neighborhood. And the Bowman Heights neighborhood is in favor of these ordinance changes and we need them to protect our residents. I thank you again for your time today and uh, please support the, uh, the changes to commercial equipment as well as commercial equipment in residential districts. Thank you, sir. All right. Ms. Bowles, your turn. Good morning, morning. Chair, Council Members. Appreciate it. Um, I know we have a very full agenda for uh, the balance of our meeting. I just wanted to uh, lay some groundwork out to kind of guide the discussion, try to make it as efficient as possible. There's 13 items on today's agenda. They reflect a wide range of initiatives, issues, and we think also opportunities. And as we work through each one, we are seeking to balance the varied interests and to do so with an eye toward accountability for the regulatory and policy needs that present themselves, as well as our intent to be responsive and adaptable to shifting demands. 
In each matter, we're seeking Council's direction on our recommendations. And I want to emphasize that uh, particularly to the members of the public who are very engaged in these initiatives, this is a workshop. No final actions will occur. But we are, uh, staff is offering recommendations and we are seeking Council's input and direction so that we can incorporate that in to our engagement with the public. The uh, diverse agenda actually represents the evolving needs of our city and the challenges that our staff faces every day to respond. Um, as I said, the agenda is an aggregate of motions that have been made over the past uh, 10 to 12 months. Um, and they all concern growth, development, and land use matters. In some cases, we've not fully fleshed out the matters with community groups yet. We seek council direction, and it's been our in intention, as some of these matters have been uh, continued over time, to seek council direction first, to incorporate your guidance and your input, and then bring that out into the public realm as we seek further public outreach. We're going to start the presentation with the city planning department, take the long lens look to our comprehensive plan that governs the underpinning of our land use. Then we'll turn to a series of more uh, time sensitive or current state growth management issues. And then later in the afternoon, we'll uh, present a series of text amendments. I do have one request before we start. Uh, as we've discussed, we're, we're using this workshop to keep like items and related items together. Um, we have a singular power, following the uh, comprehensive plan presentation, we have a singular uh, PowerPoint that will tie things together and uh, we think streamline the presentation for yourselves as well as those following along and probably also for our CCTV folks to not have to boot up so many PowerPoints. Um, to get that done though, we'd like to request, and I know we're very time limited, but we're going to try to compress um, the staff related matters items, agenda items 9 through 13, which are the staff report items. We'd like to request that you uh, move those to this morning agenda. They are teed up in that full presentation and would, would enable us to streamline them uh, pretty rapidly. Um, and to do that would leave in the afternoon item 7 and item 8, which are designated to start at 1.30 in the afternoon. So we'd appreciate a motion to move items 9 through 13 to the morning for consideration uh, and discussion. Move by Mr. Uh, Vieira, second by Mr. Carlson. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted, Ms. Price. Great. Thank you very much. Um, note also that when we uh, reconvene in the afternoon, your new Administrator for Development and Economic Opportunity, Nicole Travis, will join that discussion. I think she'll bring a lot of value to it. So again, I appreciate um, all the support you've given me through the years, and uh, we'll go ahead and kick off now. I'm going to start with Stephen Benson from our City Planning Department to talk about the comprehensive plan. Thank you. Good morning, Council. Could you morning. please uh, bring up our presentation? I'm Stephen Benson with the City Planning Department, and I'm going to pass it over to Jennifer Malone with the Planning Commission to kick us off this morning. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good morning, Council. <clears throat> Jennifer Malone here with your Planning Commission. I am joined this morning by Melissa Dickens with the Planning Commission, and as you know, Stephen Benson, your Planning Department Director. Um, today, we're going to provide information on the kickoff to the City of Tampa Comprehensive Plan update and the work we have planned for creating the vision in 2022. Um, next slide, please. So first, a little introduction. We're the Planning Commission. We're an independent, consolidated planning agency that provides long-range planning for all four local governments in Hillsborough County. So the Planning Commission is responsible for maintaining and updating the Tampa Comprehensive Plan and providing those recommendations to the City Administration and City Council. I just want to stress that the plan is not updated in a silo. We work very closely with the City Planning Department and other City staff. And then I'll turn over to Stephen to explain the City Planning Department. Thank you. As you know, the City Planning Department was created uh, in 2020 to uh, foster a strategic and multidisciplinary <laughs> approach to guiding growth, development, and redevelopment throughout the city. Uh, we will be responsible for coordinating the implementation of the goals, objectives, and policies in the comprehensive plan, which includes amending the code of ordinances, coordinating the city's review of comp plan updates, managing a variety of planning studies, and just supporting the general implementation of the entire plan. Next slide, please. So right now, the plan has um, 1,600 goals, objectives, and policies, 
and it was last updated in 2016, which focused on some tweaks and quick fixes. So right now we're actually gearing up for us substantive content changes, which will strengthen the policy direction's ability to address challenges and opportunities. We um, are hearing the public and we understand that one of those challenges is housing choice and affordability. And that is um, one of the things that we're gonna look at in this comprehensive plan update is how the plan and the tools in the plan and the current context of the plan can, um, can help uh, with, that, with that crisis. Um, we would, we're also looking at ways to streamline, update and consolidate language and coordinate policy across the plan. And last but not least, enhance the ease of use for citizens, because this is a plan for all the citizens of the city of Tampa. So this is gonna be a phased approach with the initial focus this year on background analysis and updating the vision, which is gonna lay the groundwork for the policy changes. And I'll turn it over to Melissa Dickens and ask for the next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we're not gonna reinvent the wheel with outreach. We all have been hearing from the community about uh, the changes and the growth that have been occurring. And so we're taking a variety of different pieces that have already occurred, different planning opportunities, different studies, different workshops, pulling all that information together and we're gonna use that as the public input to update the vision. Next slide, please. So you can see here, looking at all those issues, it's uh, over 6,000 different uh, folks that we've spoken to throughout all these different initiatives over the last several years. And that's what we're gonna use as the foundation to move forward. Next slide. So some of these related initiatives and the coordination that's occurred include the citywide mobility plan, uh, plans that we're uh, about to get started with, such as the South of Gandy neighborhood plan, the Palmetto Beach neighborhood plan, as well as planning projects that have uh, recently completed, such as our neighborhood commercial district plans and the urban forest management plan update. Next slide. Thanks, Stephen. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we're moving from the input from these prior studies to uh, the initial vision themes to the vision to the comprehensive plan update. So as Stephen mentioned, there were thousands of responses for these prior planning efforts. Uh, what our staff has done as an initial first step is look at the areas of commonality across those different planning efforts. So what are we consistently hearing? What are some of the messages that we're seeing across these different uh, outreach and engagement efforts? Housing affordability is certainly one of them. That's one of the uh, preliminary themes that we've identified in the vision. There are eight total areas of commonality within the initial vision, uh, the initial vision themes. And our task right now is to uh, ask the public for their thoughts. Uh, what, you know, what else needs to be added to the vision? How can we strengthen it? How can we build on it? Uh, and then after the, the public engagement, we're gonna be coming back to you with a refined and expanded vision. That vision will set the, uh, the framework for the overall comprehensive plan update. So setting the overall guiding principles for how we approach the goals, objectives, and policies. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, we're currently uh, kicking off a robust public engagement effort to get input from the public to help us build on these themes. Uh, we're hoping to take a variety of different forms to uh, get input and comments from citizens of the city. We'll be having some in-person engagement opportunities in different areas of the city. We'll be hosting some online town forums uh, related to the comp plan update and the vision. I also wanna let everyone from the public know that we do have a uh, survey open on our uh, Live, Grow, Thrive 2045.com website. We'd love for everyone who's listening to uh, go to that site and take that survey and let us know uh, the priorities for the vision. And then we also are uh, kicking off a, a video and social media campaign. The city has produced a fabulous video uh, talking about the comprehensive plan update. Given time, we're not gonna show that video today, but wanted to let everyone know that that, uh, that is also something that we're doing. Next slide, please. And next slide. Next slide, please, thank you. Uh, and so we'll close out with the initial plan update work program. Uh, we'll be back to you all in the summertime with an updated and expanded vision that we'll be asking for your approval of uh, via resolution. Then in the fall, we'll be coming to you with uh, updates to the water-related sections of the plan. 
In the winter, we'll have the initial results of our consultant study on the future land use assessment. We're getting an outside consultant to provide us some guidance on ways that the future land use section can be strengthened and enhanced. And then in uh, the spring next year, we'll be bringing the mobility section for forward. Uh, given all of the comments today and all of the uh, interest in affordable housing, we're also planning on fast tracking the housing section of the comprehensive plan. We recognize that there is a, a, a need for that and we'll be also moving that forward as well. And so this concludes the formal portion of our presentation. We are available if there are any questions. I, I'm hoping that we look at exclusionary zoning as far as this plan as well. Uh, it can be done. It's the way we have to craft it, but uh, we want to make sure we look at all avenues as it relates to the, the city plan. Ms. Cox, we recognize. You know, I worked with a lot of plans over the years, different kinds of plans, and a lot of plans end up on the shelf. Um, the comprehensive plan seems to be, at least from the public's point of view, mostly a tool just to be used for land use issues. And um, um, I was talking to Stephen on the way up. Um, you know, Hi Historic Hyde Park has done a, a vision plan for what the, what the, the, they want the textures of the environment to be like. And we've uh, worked together with the city on um, the neighborhood commercial district plans. How do we, how do we, the, the question is, how do we bring this to life in a way that it's not just a land use um, uh, qualifier? How do, we, how do we use it to actually improve the lives of, of citizens and make it real? Good question, Mr. Cross. I, I think that's a great question. So uh, my response to that is, that is the role of our department, of this new department, is to take all of the strategies in the plan. There's a lot of information in there, as, as was mentioned, over 1,600 different policies. It's a lot to go through. Many of those have not been acted on. Many of those are out of date. We need to refresh them and identify new ones. And the city planning department will be re responsible for taking those policies and making sure they're actually being implemented at the city level. So uh, we, will, we will take that forward and uh, totally acknowledge your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, we can continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council. We appreciate you. your time. Thank you, guys. Chair, as we transition uh, to the next part of the presentation, uh, Ms. Abby Feely will run uh, through the balance of um, the agenda, items three through six, and then uh, nine through 13. And as we said, we've got a contiguous, if you will, PowerPoint that should be able to streamline that and kind of keep it on track. So if uh, folks can pull that um, growth management PowerPoint up, we'll turn over to uh, Ms. Abby Feely. Good morning, Council. Good morning. Abby Feely, Director of Development and Growth Management. Um, we do have a hefty presentation for you this morning. I have tried to group everything together so we can just kind of zoom through. Um, this is really a culmination of many motions that have been out um, for several months, some of them almost a year, um, and we came to you and asked to have a coordinated discussion today. So our first item we're going to be discussing is the access to local roads um, and streets. This, I believe, came up for you when a multifamily project um, went into a commercial piece of property. It did not have access on an arterial collector. It came to you on appeal. So today I just want to take really about five, ten minutes to go through kind of how all this works. So I'm going to take a step back and, and go through the code with you and then we'll take a step forward on the recommendations that we have. So when do projects have to access an arterial or collector street, when are they required um, or allowed to access a local street? The code talks about it in two ways. Uh, the first is under our special use criteria, and the second is in the general parking section of the code that talks about non-residential parking lots and where they are required to access. Uh, the code sets out what are special uses, um, special uses are uses that are deemed permitted if they meet the criteria. And there's two sets of these types of uses. The S1s that are processed administratively and the S2s that come before you that you see on a regular rezoning night. The S1s have sets of criteria that go with them. 
And if the applicant does not meet those criteria, they must appeal to city council for the waiver of that criteria. You see these a lot in ALFs. ALFs get six beds. If they want seven beds, they come back before you and ask for that seventh bed because under the administrative process, we are not entitled to grant that waiver. Um, in relation to the local streets, uh, if a property only has access on a local street, whether it's residential or commercial, we must provide them with access to their property. I'm just going to show you a couple of these real quick, and these are from throughout the city. Uh, this is the old wholesome bread factory that is now residential property on Horatio. Uh, this is, was a commercial CI piece of property developed with residential. It has three access points on local streets. Um, this is the warehouse loss on Florida. Again, this was denied. It was an adaptive reuse of an existing structure. So it could not access on to an arterial or collector. So the access is on the local street. This is on uh, Grady near West Shore, right next to Met West. That's Boy Scout Boulevard to the north there. Um, this came in as a special use uh, for re residential in commercial intensive. This was the Without Walls Church, you may remember from years ago. Uh, this also, um, this was an interesting case, and I pulled this one because it really shows kind of how this issue has bounced back and forth uh, in the code and with legal's interpretation of this matter. So this came in as a special use, only has access on a local street, commercial intensive piece of property. Um, it could have things like a car dealership, a Publix. It could have very intensive uses that would not be subject to having to access an arterial or a collector and be able to access Grady Avenue. When it came in and asked for residential, that residential then was required to access the arterial or the collector. But that could not be achieved. The special use was initially denied as it didn't meet that criteria, but the legal department at the time of this application said when a property only has access on the local street and they could qualify for much more intensive uses than what is this, that criteria would not be applicable. So this um, application went through, the project was constructed, um, but it really did raise the question of how did this all come about? It's a special use criteria, special uses went into effect in the late 1980s. Um, our city was very different back then. Our development patterns were different. The speeds of travel were different. Um, and the protection of the neighborhoods um, was still very much the same. And we desire to continue with that today. So um, the other thing you may recall is a few weeks ago, Vic Bide did a presentation for you that talked about the access onto arterials and collectors, the speed of that, and how that actually causes more crashes and more traffic fatalities um, and, and um, injuries than if they were placed on the local streets. This also in keeping with um, our Vision Zero strategies is where we are today. So I know I covered a lot. Um, I do kind of want to show you real quick. I pulled the use table. If I could have the Elmo for just a moment, please. What I refer to as the Elmo. The wolf. If I could have the wolf. Um, what you see here is in the commercial general zoning districts, um, all of those S1s, 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 that's where the multifamily and single family attached have to access. Could CTT we still pull can't up? See it. We don't have it yet. Sorry, Brian, I should have let you know I was going to bounce back and forth. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Thank you, All Mr. right. Oh, Mr. Potter. Um, so I think the question really before council today in relation to this issue is how would we like to proceed? Do we, do we want to make an adjustment to this criteria because of the circumstances? Um, we initially had talked about removing the criteria for the access to the arterial collector that runs with multifamily 
or making multifamily a permitted use instead of a special use, which you could then run the RM24 standards with. So the recommendations I had on the screen are, there are two alternative recommendations. The one is here, what I'm showing is, in the CG and also in the next category in the CI, um, residential multifamily in commercial is a special use one. The two criteria are that it must access an arterial or collector and it must meet the RM24 dimensional standards. For, this is also the same for townhome. For the three other types of residential, which are houses, um, detached, semi-detached, which is the duplex, or a two-family, which is a stack, a unit up and a unit down, they do not have those same two criteria. They have uh, a different criteria, and it is not related to the access on the street. So um, the recommendations for consideration today would either be to make the multifamily and single family attached an X, which would make them permitted in the commercial districts. It would open up other lands. It would separate them from having to go through a separate process. That being said, the RM24 standards would still run with that, meaning setbacks, height, step backs, which you all are familiar with. Um, or the other recommendation would be the removal of the requirement to access an arterial or a collector. So that is our report on the access for the local streets, and we can open it up to discussion. Any questions? Mr. Carlson, you recognize? Uh, did you take this out to the neighborhood associations, and what feedback did you get? So the way the workshop works today, we're starting with you, and dependent on, <coughs> and I have a couple on our other topics, we're going to go out with the neighborhoods and, and talk through those. Um, it would all depend on the path you would like to see this take and then we will, um, we can use the planning today and have that open discussion. We can go to some of the neighborhood associations. Is it possible um, to narrow it down to areas that already have a certain density? Um, uh, like I, I, we shouldn't say that it's allowed in one part of the city and not other part of the city, but how do we do it in a non-discriminatory way? Because in South Tampa, I don't think this would be popular at all. Um, but there are areas that have heavy density. Um, is, is there a way to say that, that this would apply only there or does it have to be citywide? Right now, this is applicable citywide. Okay. Any other questions? I, I'm sure you know, Mr. Dingfeld is probably watching, so I'm sure he'll call you with some questions, I'm sure. You may proceed. Mr. Rand, did you have any questions on that item? So I know you're listening back there. Oh, sure. Okay, so then at the present time, if there isn't a direct recommendation, I mean, we can socialize this further with um, the neighborhood really and come back with changes. Um, I think the other thing you're gonna see is at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna ask you for another workshop in June so that we can have a target for when we'll have many of the discussions that keep evolving and we're not always on so many agendas coming and then not having dedicated time to have these discussions. So that'd be good, because Mr. Citro's out too, so that'd be good. Mr. Carlson, J can I just ask a process question? Um, sure. The old rule for workshops, I think, was that we wouldn't make motions. Is that applicable today, or are we gonna, are we gonna make motions on the on the dis items discussed? Uh, well, you know, there's no rule that okay. we can't make a motion, sir. All right. Make a motion. Is that what you're asking, sir? You want to make a motion? I don't know. Okay. All right. Ms. Fiedema, let's continue. Okay. The second item that was on, all right, or how do I put that? Second item that was on the agenda was the discussion of building height, mass, and aesthetics. This was a motion that was made by Councilman Dingfelder and second by Councilman Carlson when we made the adjustments um, for the definition of height. And this was in response to the new FEMA maps that were updated and the required elevations that were emerging in the velocity zone and the AE zone. The request was that we look at the potential for uh, addressing monolithic structures and also for potential aesthetics. 
To quickly just revisit, uh, the definition of height that was changed um, from grade to be the vertical distance between the required finished floor to the highest point of the structure. And that required finished floor is driven by the FEMA regulations. In some instances, this can vary from five feet to 12 feet above grade, uh, and council did express their concern related to the potential of monolithic structures newly constructed next to traditional homes that had remained in the area. The code has predominantly two building heights, our city code, and that, ooh, I went the wrong way, sorry. We have the 35 feet, and I know that you all are familiar with this from the recent um, amendment by Mr. Michelini that sought to change a 30 to a 35, but in our traditional zoning districts, all of our res single family districts and the RM12, 16 and 18, as well as the RO and RO1, uh, you can go to 35 feet for maximum building height. In the RM24, you can go to 60 feet but at 30 feet, and now with the newly adopted amendment you did last week, you can go to 35 feet, and then you step the building in. And that step in is a one foot to one foot. Uh, LaShawn Dock, our senior planning coordinator, performed research on other jurisdictions. Um, the city of St. Pete does have a step back approach, and that's shown here on your screen. They also have an increase in yards. You'll see at the bottom there, if your structure is above 24 feet in height, you increase your front yard from 25 feet to 35 feet. And this creates those opportunities for the passage of air and light. It creates those opportunities um, for massing relief uh, in relation to the structures. In relation to aesthetics, um, we found that predominantly aesthetics are contained in special districts, overlay districts, um, but outside of that, it would defer to the Florida Building Code, which requires you know, a certain number of openings um, and, and facade treatments. We found that some jurisdictions addressed aesthetics in their zoning codes. Uh, Bradenton had a form-based code. Miami has a citywide form-based code uh, that address aesthetics. I just wanna show you naturally kind of what is occurring out in our community without any regulation related to this matter. Uh, this is over um, off of Homer Street. Um, you'll see I put the yellow line there. That kind of gives you where that finished floor requirement is um, and shows you the fenestration of the structure. Um, these are elevated. Here is, this is on Davis Island. Uh, this is a new structure here with an elevation next to um, a traditional structure that has been in place. And these are two that are down on the river. Um, you can see that most of these structures organically incorporate some sort of treatment at the ground level when they are being required to have elevation. Um, so it, without the code requiring an aesthetic or a number of windows or those other treatments, um, it appears that this is happening naturally. What are our recommendations in relation to the research that we conducted? Um, in relation to height and mass, uh, we would recommend that incorporating a step back of the structure above the 35 feet um, for those structures in the VE and AE, which are the ones that require the greatest elevation of the structures. Um, in looking at that, we would recommend a two to one step back, step back so for every two feet of the structure above 35 feet, it would step in a foot. So if it was going to 45 feet um, because it had a 10 foot finished floor, that would mean that at the 35 feet, it would be stepping in an additional five foot all the way around the structure. In relation to the aesthetics, we are not recommending any modifications for incorporation of minimum windows or minimum undulation at the ground floor. And that is our presentation for the height and mass. Any questions, Mr. Dillon? All right, you may proceed.
Okay, the West Tampa Alley Access. There were several motions on today's agenda related to the West Tampa Alley Access. Um, they're here on your screen for you. You have the sheet that I marked up for you. Can may I borrow that for a moment, please? Thank you. This is going to be item number nine and ten on your agenda. Um, as I said, this had several motions uh, related with it, and um, we're we're going to talk talk through those now, just to give you some background. Um, the West Tampa Overlay District was amended. Um, it, it started really back kind of in 2019 um, and was an effort of the West Tampa CRA. Uh, with COVID and other kind of delays, it was finally adopted and effective on February 9th, 2019. And the main change in relation to the topic, there were several changes to the overlay, but in relation to the topic we're talking about today, um, I have provided you with the change that occurred related to alley access. And I would like to spend uh, a minute just reading this and going over um, it because I think there are some key terms in this provision that have now come into play through the implementation of shall versus may. Um, so the change was that if an existing lot is adjacent to an open and used public alley, vehicular access to the site shall provide for, shall be provided from the alley as the primary vehicular access point provided it meets minimum standards. So I want to take a moment here because open and used, okay, if an alley is open and used um, and then that you shall provide that as the primary vehicular access. Now that's the primary. It doesn't mean you couldn't also have a secondary. We haven't run into that yet, but it shall be used as the primary. Um, and then the last part of that is meets minimum standard. And I'm gonna show you some pictures of what comes into question when you're trying to make a determination if something meets minimum standards. The other thing is this code change did not provide any exceptions. It didn't say if there's a grand tree in the middle of the alley and you cannot access because you're the fifth lot in and you would have to tear down this grand tree. Um, it did not say if the alleys are less than 14 feet, which is not safe maneuverability in an alley for traffic or pulling in and out into a driveway, that you can get an exception. There were no criteria for exceptions and there were no criteria defining what was open and used um, so what has happened or what I'm going to start to talk about the implementation um, is that when a property cannot fulfill this requirement, they are being processed through the design exception process if we're going to talk about that. So I just want to let you know that Carlos Ramirez, uh, chair of the West Tampa Infrastructure Committee is here on the second floor. We have been in contact with him. Eric attended their meeting last month. And um, we have opened up communication on this. Um, it was our understanding that the intent of changing this provision uh, is to minimize the number of driveways along the streets so that they are creating a safer pedestrian experience um, and to promote more eyes on the street for safety. So alleys are addressed in our code under 27283.12, that's the transportation section. And I just want to take a few minutes and walk, walk through this as well. Um, this says that all off-street parking spaces may utilize public alley right-of-way for maneuvering into and out of legally sized parking spaces, providing the following are met. If the alley is unimproved, the developer must improve the alley per the Department of Public Works standards or if the alley is already being accessed by other properties on the block, the alley must be evaluated by the Department of Public Works to determine if the existing condition of the alley is able to support the additional traffic. 
the Department of Public Works may require the developer to improve the alley. So what meets standards? Now, there are code also expresses exemptions. It is not required to pave the unimproved alley provided for single family, I'm sorry, for single family detached, semi-detached, and two family. So we've talked about this. Regular house, duplex, two family is the stack, a unit up and down. They are not required to pave unimproved alley provided that the existing alley surface meets criteria for the unpaved alley. So again, if existing alley surface does not conform to mobility's technical standards, then it must, the applicant must modify the alley surface to the nearest intersection. Um, if the alley is already being accessed by other properties on the block, mobility will evaluate the alley to determine if its existing condition will support the additional traffic. Let me just say through discussions and preparation for today, um, that is not just pavement. That's pavement and stormwater design because yeah. they just don't let you pave an alley and flood all your neighbors. We have to be mindful of how that asphalt is then impacting all the other properties that are on the alley. If the alley is required, this was another nuance, if the alley is required to be paved, that requires a right-of-way use permit. It's a separate permitting process. It requires separate review by mobility, separate design plans um, that is outside the typical building permit pro process. So if you come into us for a BLD, we, the building permit, and you now are required to make that improvement for your access, you are also then required to do an ROW and have those two processes running. Um, together to ensure that prior to that building being uh, receiving certificate of occupancy that those two processes are completed. So what does this mean in terms of West Tampa? And um, I bring this block up for you and on this block I actually put the year built for each of these structures. Um, so you'll see on this block, which has Arowana to the west, Fig Street to the north, Campania to the east, and West North B to the south. Um, and you may, you may remember this property because it came to you on appeal. It was denied access to the alley per the code, and it came to ask permission. So when that appeal came, council said, boy, this is confusing. This is the only house on the block that doesn't Every other property on this block accesses the street. Their mid-block, they would be the first ones that have to access the alley. And that made me think, let's look at this. Let's see. When were these structures built? How many of them? How long is this going to take for us to get to full redevelopment where every structure on a block is going to have alley access? Um, and ultimately, council overturned um, development coordination, and granted access to the street. So this block ranges with structures from 1920 to 2020. And all of them have driveway access to the street. Now let's look at the alley. <laughs> I'm looking at it. It's not improved. Would this be considered open and used? And if it's not open and used, what does that mean should this individual have been required to improve it and meet the code? Here is another block. This one is at Rome um, and West St. John. Um, this too was a design exception. Um, this has at the corner here, this is Busto Plumbing. This has a commercial property, so I just wanted to kind of show that it has other uses besides just residential. Um, this too, if you look at the houses for a minute, these houses range from 1939 up to 1995. Um, there's one 2019. So um, again, the predominant pattern of access to these homes was through a, the street. Um, let's take a look at the alley. 
the eastern end of the alley has some improvement. This is what it looks like. Now, is that considered to city standard per the mobility department? I do not believe so. Just when, and I think some of the impression may have been when this went into effect and we say, okay, let's go ahead and make them all access the alley that they're just gonna put an apron from the back of their house onto this condition. And this isn't an acceptable condition to the city. So then they're required to improve it. The cost of that improvement and engineering is then transferred on to the cost of the homes. Which, um, oh, I'm going backward again, sorry. Was this explained to the West Tampa CAC like you're explaining this, Ms. Peter? We have not had that opportunity yet. That's part of my recommendation is, is to go back and work right with them. Here. It's going to be pretty difficult to. Yes. Mr. Chairman. Yes, you're right. I believe that case was a. Uh, heard about six months ago, seven months ago, eight months ago, something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. And that, it was a gentleman that his whole family, generations of the family had lived there, mm -hmm. and he inherited the house of wonder and knocked it down and built a new house for him and his wife and kids, if I remember the, mm -hmm. the conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I've handed out to the council members is the map of West Tampa, and it's uh, the, the ones with green on it, all the ones that are open, the ones that are <clears throat> in different color, uh, orange I would say is the color, are the ones that have been vacated so that we have an understanding of what you're talking about. Excellent, thank you. Um, so at the western end of the alley, I just wanted to take a look and show you again. Um, and you'll see in this picture, there are some fence structures. I mean, we face that a lot of the alleys haven't been used in a long time or never, and fences arrive in them or fences are erected in them. Sometimes the city will go out and ask that the applicant, you know, remove those fences. Um, so I just wanted to kind of um, give those illustrations for you. So, so since this was passed, one other item I'd like to talk about is this became effective the day it was passed. Um, in the future, we have learned now that when you are making these code changes, we're going to ask that you give us 90 days to an effective date because it went into effect the day it was passed, and two of the three examples that Ms. Sanchez would like an explanation on were simply missed because they were processed so quickly after it was passed that staff did not have time to have adequate training to know. They went into the building department. The building department has been reviewing them for years under a certain standard. The standards now change. It's effective immediately, and we just didn't catch up, and mistakes happen. And so on two of those, that is what happened. Um, Thank so, you for explaining that. We're all human. My, my, my team processes a lot of applications. Great. You know, we process about 1,300 design exceptions, and unfortunately, a few have, have issues. I'm, I'm always here, and I'm always up front with you, and I will continue to do that. Um, so what I have here for you is a quick accounting of so far what's been processed as design exceptions, um, the addresses they've been processed at. We've had 13 so far since this passed. Um, eight of them were disapproved, and five of them, it was actually four of them that was approved. The asterisk shows the overturned decision that granted approval by city council. One other um, comment was made in relation to these were all a single developer that received these approvals or denials. This is a variety of developers within the West Tampa area. These are not the sole application of a single developer. So what are our challenges and opportunities? I've tried to incorporate a lot of them into my discussion as I've shown you these the implementation of this new, and this was again privately initiated, this new um, code requirement. We are in concert with the neighborhood in wanting to promote walkability, into wanting to promote pedestrian safety. Um, in preparation for this, I did have a discussion with Vic Vide to kind of talk about what are those minimum standards for alleys which would make them safe, and then what are our other options? Are there other options where we could potentially look at the alley not for the vehicular access, but for the pedestrian access? Could we create some east-west connections there where we make the alley the pedestrian walk, we improve it, we put some grass, you know, versus we 
try to shift all those driveways from the front to the back because as you'll see that redevelopment is going to take probably 25 or 30 years till we get to a point where each of these would be redeveloped i don't know that it that that's you know probably a pretty um aggressive estimate um, so the other thing is um, alternatives to requiring the alley access um, or criteria for the exemptions. Much like you have the criteria for the sidewalk installation exemptions, this code provision should probably have some minimum criteria for an exemption. If 75% of the block does not access onto the alley or there is not a single access onto the alley, perhaps that would be justification for an exemption. Also defining what is open and used. Um, so I want to stop right there for one second because the third case that Ms. Sanchez asked about and I want to make sure that we cover is the one that was denied and then overturned. One day it was in a cell as denied and the next day it was in as approved. That was um, the 25 09 West North B Street. That application came in for a building permit. The alley was completely overgrown. Um, building stopped them and said, you're required alley access. Uh, the applicant called Eric Cotton. They reviewed everything, looked at the pictures together. It was overgrown. There was no access. Mr. Cotton instructed them to please go ahead and submit for the design exception that we would issue it and keep the building permit moving forward. Um, it came in, our urban design coordinator went out to the site. The day he went out to the site, the alley had been cleared. So he denied it, not knowing the conversation that Mr. Cotton had had and not knowing that the conditions of the alley had changed that morning. So the applicant comes back and said, we had this whole discussion. I made assumptions and went forward based on the conditions that were in existence and what we did. How can this now not be? And I said, well, we have to have predictability in what we're doing. We did send them down that path to go back and then make them redo the building permits, redo everything. You know, it, it just happened to be a matter of circumstance. And I felt that we need to stand on the direction that we gave that person when they came in our door. So we upheld that. And like I had mentioned earlier, I'm going to tell you what happened. That's what happened. And well, that's how well, it moved well, forward. Well, we're appreciative of that. And just looking at the map, and Ms., you know, I'm a West Tampa guy myself, but you know, Mr. Ferrand is the West Tampa mayor. So you know, looking, at, looking at this map here, and, you know, there, there are going to be some challenges just looking at the alley. So uh, that's why I'm hoping that we have a good discussion with the And, and even there, Mr. Law. Chairman, some alleys are half open yeah, and half closed. closed. So there's another obstacle. Yep. Um, so the varying character of the blocks and existing development pattern that we just talked about that I showed you, kind of how some blocks have no properties that access, um, the timing of redevelopment, balancing the delivery of city services. As we talked about this, if that alley has not been used by solid waste for pickup, if it has not been used in certain ways, and now we have shifted the house to the alley, are we now going to be having service on both the street and the alley? Um, those are things that we need to talk through and figure out from a service delivery standpoint. And then, yeah, I, I think that I think that we have to be careful with that. I was part of neighborhood association in Hyde Park when we pushed to keep the alley service in. Um, the city had to make special accommodation after after a lot of protesting and they got rid of it in other parts of the city and that was a decision by solid waste not a decision by the neighborhoods and and I'll make my longer statement about alleys in a minute but I think we need to go back to alley service and we need to protect the alleys and not use that as an excuse to shut them down thank you I hear what you say Mr. Carlson but the problem you have right now from even from the driver's standpoint the drivers are complaining because what's happening now the size that they're building of these trucks now exceed and, and, and a lot of the drivers are getting uh you know i forgot the code they're now they, they're, they're getting disciplined for bumps and scratches on the on the city vehicles my understanding so, is that they they um had special trucks i don't remember all the details that we can bring some of the hyde park people in but you know mr miranda always says we need to treat uh west tampa and other areas the way we do 
um, uh, South Tampa and other areas. And in, in South Tampa, there were ac accommodations made. And I'll just say that I think that um, alleys are, are, are an important part of planning for quality of life. Alley access is very important. Um, in South Tampa, they'll, we'll, we'll have people at Pitchfork so we, if we propose to cl shut down alleys or, or take away uh, garbage service. In West Tampa and the rest of the area, I think in, in 10 or 20 years, we're going to regret that we're shutting down these. I almost always vote against vacating alleys. And I think it should be the city's responsibility to clear them out. The fact that they're overgrown should not be an excuse to, to vacate an alley. The city should have a fund to go in and clear them out and pave them. Um, we, we should take it on as a mobility responsibility because this is how urban uh, living, urban dwellings happen. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be putting suburban housing designs in urban areas. Thank you. I agree with what you're saying on that point, uh, Mr. Carlson, because you, you look at the east side of town and you go try these alleys, you can't even get through these alleys. So I guess when the city said we're going to start doing garbage service in the front, the alley just became an obsolete thing to clean and do. So I see what you're saying. It, it, and I guess the city has now told homeowners the alley is their responsibility to keep clean, but most of them don't keep them clean, so that's what we have right now. So you're right on that point. So just, just to wrap up, um, We, um, when this matter came up and we started implementing with the design exceptions and trying to figure out what some of these things meant um, and the motion was made by council to report back, we did initiate discussion with Carlos Ramirez. Like I said, he is here on the second floor uh, this morning. And um, what we would like to do is we would like to go back to Oh, there's an error in my presentation. We would like to go back and work with them. We'd like to figure out, you know, what was the objective, what are our means of achieving it, um, and then if it remains as um, the shall, you know, setting up some criteria for those potential exemptions. Um, where this links into our further discussion today is in the design exceptions, which I think you've started to hear from the public about and the design exception ones versus the design exception twos and what's covered and we have a memo on that under staff reports and I'm going to kind of hold off on going full blown into that. Um, we would like to start, we would like to go back, Carlos is aware, we'd like to come back and have these discussions um, and work with the CAC and then what I'd like to do is provide you with a staff report of our progress on April 21st. Um, and if we have recommendations at that time, I would tee up those recommendations to come back to you on the June 23rd workshop with what those changes would be. Um, you know, the quickest change right now would be to go back to the May versus the shall, which is what it was up until last year. Um, but I think we can find a way to better define and set some standards. The other thing that we have received is Jesus Nino has, from the West Tampa CRA, has an inventory of the alleys. Um, you know, maybe it is setting some of those standards that this would not be applicable to alleys less than a certain width, and then we would move on from trying to find a balance between what is safe and what is achievable and, and how we take this forward. But I think right now, the impression and the expectation from West Tampa is that you either do it or you don't. I mean, there, there are no criteria for us granting the exception, which has kind of put our team under fire as to, well, why did you do that? Why did you, you know, we are reviewing this on a case-by-case -case basis, much like what you felt when it came to you to say, everything on this block doesn't access. We're the only one. We'd be the first one. We're going to have to improve from our house all the way to the intersection. This means this. Um, so our urban designer is using his professional judgment in making those decisions and those decisions are being rendered in order to keep this moving forward. If that's not the desire and the direction of council is deny them all, we want to hear them on appeal, we don't know, you know, we're trying to find that balance right now in implementing something that came from a privately initiated tax amendment is now effective, and I spoke to you about that, and how we're going to go forward to achieve the objective. Yeah, I wouldn't want to hear no doubt deny at all. That'd be a problem. Mr. Carlson? Yeah, I wonder, maybe this is a, a discussion for the CRA, but 
how many alleys are there in, <clears throat> in West Tampa and, and how much would it cost, do you have any idea, if the city went in and cleared them all? I, I don't. I know the they CRA. are in the process. The CRA is in the process of clearing them. That's what happened in the one example that I shared with you. Yeah. I could definitely work with Jesus to get you that information. I mean, if we, if we look at it, the, the problem is if we look at it on a tactical basis, Kate, project by project, little, uh, you know, individual home by home, um, we'll have a different view than if we're looking at, at it systemically. And that's the whole purpose of plans, as you know. We need to figure out how, how we want our community to develop. We're urbanizing our area. And, and if you look back, the, the alleys were there originally anyway. And we should, I, I think we should um, plan to, to continue to develop them and improve the way our, our community looks and, and how people interact with it. And we shouldn't use um, the alleys being overgrown as an excuse to shut them down and vacate them and, and, and turn the houses around. I mean, what, what it really is, as I said before, is it's building suburban homes in an urban area. And the, the urban homes that are there um, and those homeowners are going to get very upset that we're allowing this to happen, I imagine. I, I have heard from both sides of the neighborhood. I did hear from several people who do not want to be forced to use the alleys. Um, in new construction, so I, I think going back and trying to have further discussion and find a balance is a good way forward. Joanna, you recognize I, I would only kind of, I can only speak for this map that I, that I passed out, but I would imagine if every neighborhood votes on it, that this neighborhood here will vote to close. West Tampa, I'm talking about. It's just my opinion, because as I look at it, there, there's I would say it's a 60/40 that already closed. And uh, I don't see the advantage in West Tampa anyway of having an open alley. It causes enormous amount of uh, cost to keep paving and keep cutting and keep doing what? At the end of the day, uh, you plant whatever you're going to plant there, you said, and it's going to cost more upkeep. On the other side, there's less money for other things to do. So where is the balance and how do you do things or where do you address your resources to do the best thing for the community? Is it a same old, same old, or to make some changes so that you can maybe quote unquote do something in the backyard instead of making illegal housing, make them housing so that you can have more affordable housing. And right now, I would say that this city has thousands of illegal dwellings that are not paying their taxes because they've converted them without a permit to two and three apartments in one house, and that goes on daily on a daily basis that's happening in this city. And instead of going after them and doing something to have more money to do something to help someone else, we're standing in status quo. Thank you. Mr. Citrill, you're Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Ms. Feely, thank you for doing this. And I'm, I'm just talking on the alleys right now. Whenever we have someone come before this council for vacating of alleys, there's always two things they say illegal dumping and, and, and homelessness drug use. So they're looking to help maintain their own property or bring these alleys into their property so they can feel safer. I don't know if you've ever heard that or not, but again, when people stand at that podium or they're downstairs standing before the camera, those are the things that are always brought up. Illegal dumping that they're tired of cleaning up and, and finding syringes and crack pipes. So this, in, in my opinion, closing down these alleys is a way for the homeowners to feel safe if there is a majority of homeowners on that block that feel the same way. So thank you for this discussion, Ms. Abby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it's more of a community discussion <coughs> now to take back to the community in that CAC, but, uh, you know, uh, I know uh, I know West Tampa is doing a good job just to try to keep them clean now with the program Hey Sue's put in play. Uh, so they're doing a heck of a job with that program. Some of the photos we've seen. So we're happy that they're doing that. Doing a fantastic job. Um, if I if I may for just a moment, I I would like to ask. I think Mr. Ramirez did not speak during public comment because he was waiting and he does represent. What's the workshop? He's your guest. This would be fun. The West Tampa CRA, um, the West Tampa CAC Infrastructure Group. He is on the second floor. All right. If that would be possible, if he would like to comment. All right. We'll allow it. Unless we lost him. 
and then I'm going to have LaShawn come up and we're going to move on to the alcoholic beverage All right. section. Cool. And I think we're a little fun, making Steve. progress. A little fun. There he is. Good morning, sir. State your name for us. Good morning. Carlos Ramirez, uh, 2103 West Carmen. I'm with the West Tampa CRA CAC. I'm the current chair. All right, Ms. Feeling, say so you have some comments for us? Yes, sir. A uh, couple of things, just a little bit of background. Uh, the CAC made a motion back in June of 2019 to look at the West Tampa overlay to see if there were any changes that we could do to help our area. Um, we worked Can you pull the mic up to you a little bit, sir? Just a little bit to you. So yeah. Is that better? Yeah, pull it up a little bit. There you go. How's that? That's fine, sir. Thank All you. All right. All right, so uh, there was a motion by the CAC in um, June of 2019. Uh, we worked for about a year uh, with city staff, making sure that we were trying to cover everything, all the different departments. And then in July of 2020, we brought up a motion back to the CAC and a presentation of the changes that we wanted to make, and it was unanimously passed. The, this particular issue, the alley access was one of those. Um, there were three things that we wanted to accomplish with, with this uh, safety, which um, Ms. Feely did a great job talking about pedestrian safety, uh, keeping the character of West Tampa, and economic redevelopment. So we've talked a lot about walkability. We have a sidewalk program now. So that's kind of, that was a big incentive. Uh, with the big new houses that are coming into West Tampa. A lot of them have double car garages, which means extra wide driveways, which means less sidewalk because now the sidewalk is cut for a driveway. Um, and now our, you know, people who are using the sidewalks, I have to watch out for cars coming in and out. The other thing is a lot of these driveways are not wide enough for two cars. As time goes on, people start using their garages for storage, so they're parking outside. Uh, now two cars parked, in front of the garage is blocking the sidewalk and it's pushing pedestrians, sometimes people with wheelchairs, elderly kids, into the roadway to go around them. Um, those are things that we looked at as far as pedestrian safety. Uh, keeping the character of West Tampa with these double car garages and these double wide um, driveways, the front of the house no longer has a porch or it has a tiny little porch. Um, I was on my porch this morning, I talked to my neighbor who was on his porch as well. So it's our way of keeping eyes on the street, keep making sure things are safe. Kids are playing outside. We can all see them. Many times I've had a neighbor saying, hey, your son is getting too rowdy or whatever. It's, it's community. It's being out there. Um, so with, with the big things, there are no front porches. And then the last thing is economic redevelopment. As you know, all the walkable neighborhoods, I mean, it's even a score on Zillow. All, all the walkable neighborhoods in Tampa are doing very well, they're affluent neighborhoods. So our charge in the West Tampa CRA CAC is to bring back West Tampa, uh, redevelop it, and this was a great way for us to do that as well. So in order to meet those three goals, we wanted to push those driveways in the back and make sure that we cleared the sidewalks, kept the front porches, eyes on the street, and make it a walkable community where people wanted to move to and people wanted to you know, invest in. Um, I understand things are not perfect, but we are looking at different things we can do. Uh, I don't think abandoning the alleys is what we need to do. They're great tools that we have. Um, we can use them for different things. Uh, I know Abby and I have been discussing different things, where it makes sense, where it doesn't make sense. Solid ways being picked up from the alley is not one of those things. We, we're okay with keeping that on the street. Uh, it's just about keeping those cars away from the pedestrians on the sidewalks. Um, and then the other thing I just really quickly want to bring up is that the, the West Tampa overlay is bigger than the CRA. So we, during this process, we had a lot of community involvement. We didn't just go back to our neighborhoods. We have 11 members on the C CAC they all took it back to their organizations. We shared it with all the neighborhoods. Um, I know we. I know Ms. Sanchez shared it with her neighborhood, which is not technically in the CRA, but it is West Tampa, and it is in the West Tampa overlay. So we've had a lot of public involvement and people, and, and you know, opportunities for everybody to be able to chime in, including developers and home builders who came to our infrastructure subcommittee meeting uh, as we were discussing these things and gave input as well. 
Uh, so if, if you guys have any further questions, I'm here. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming this morning, sir. Like, like I uh, said earlier, looking at this map that Ms. Feely has given us, um, there, there are going to probably be some challenges, I'm going to be honest with you, uh, trying to go from one stance to another. So I'm hoping that we have some good robust discussions and uh, come up with some criteria to bring back to the council. We can make some uh, good decisions of, of moving forward. But again, thank you for coming. Anyone else have any questions? Again, thank you, sir. Mr. Mayor Scalpel, you. you recognize. You know, looking at this map, um, uh, which a lot of it's a lot of it's my district. Um, you know, each neighborhood is different. I see that there's a lot of uh, open, there's a lot of uh, vacated, but you know, certain areas, I would say, I don't know. Let's go like along the river. Uh, it's hard. You need that alley access because it's hard to get how the houses are built, the properties are, and sidewalks and everything. It's hard to get the you know the trash can up there, and uh, some of the streets are narrow, some dead end. I know here, um, you know, like off Howard Avenue, closer to the river, uh, you have a lot of one-way streets. I'm sorry, one-way dead end streets. Um, you know, I mean, it's you got to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. But then in other parts of West Tampa, where you see you know better connectivity, like off Hines, off Cabana. Um, you know, the streets will connect all the way through and you can, I see where there's more, you know, vacated areas. Where, I mean, again, it's just, it's, it's street by street, case by case, because um, each neighborhood is, is different depending on what part of the map you're looking at, so. All right, Ms. Ms. Feely. Thank you, Chairman Goods. Um, so we're gonna wrap up now with item five in this deck presentation. We have about 30 minutes to the noon hour, and then we're gonna do the um, staff reports, which would be item 11, 12, 13, and six. And we're gonna aim to be expeditious and, and keep you on track. All right, thank you. Good morning, Chairman and Council members. It's good to see everyone in person. Thank you so much for your time. LaShawn Dock, City Planning. And um, again, this is item number five on the agenda. And I'm going to bring to you a, um, a follow-up on alcoholic beverage sales. This would include a discussion of hours of operation and distance separation, a follow-up on that. And Council, you may remember this conversation started at the end of October in 2020. Um, there were a series of motions that were made for um, staff to come before Council and discuss the hours of operation and distance separation. Um, this is regarding alcoholic beverage sales permits in April of 2021, um, council made a motion for staff to come and have that discussion and staff came before you. We discussed the hours of operation um, regarding the alcohol sales and then we went into distance separation, um, especially in urban villages in the creation of those distance separation requirements. When we last reported to council in October, council made a motion for staff to come back to have further discussions and they were on four items. So one included the discussion of the issue of hours of operation. Um, this is considering the um, standardizing the hours um, for businesses. And then the second item was the convenience store issues. And I believe this was a motion made by um, council member um, Goods. Um, and this was a concern regarding the uses um, surrounding the convenience stores um, and the proximity to residential. And then the third item was the distance separation, and this was distance separation in reference to the um, urban service areas or in the urban villages. And then the last item was to discuss whether or not alcohol would run with the land. And we have Susan Johnson Velez here with the legal department. So when we're at that portion of the presentation, I'm gonna turn it over to Susan um, to present for you. So after each one, I'll just stop and pause for a second in case there are questions. Um, first, we will talk about the hours of operation. Um, I just wanna review with you, Council, that um, the hours um, of operation are held within two chapters of the code. They're in Chapter 14 and then Chapter 27. And so first, I would like to review Chapter 14. The chart before you identifies the uses on the left um, broken out by use by alcoholic beverage sales type. And then it includes the business operating hours as well as the alcoholic beverage sales hours. So you can see the restaurant establishments are, are there along with your bar lounge, your small and large venue uses. 
And next we'll go to the hours of operation in chapter 27. So this chart is broken out the same way. It has the uses um, listed on the left. And then there are two categories that are provided. One is the special use one category, which is our administrative review. You don't see those come before you. Um, they're processed by staff internally. Um, and then there's the special use two. The special use two is what comes before council. That's the public hearing process. Um, one thing that's important to note when we're talking about the hours of sale for alcoholic beverages, you'll see the two categories for restaurants. For a special restaurant, we have embedded in the code a special use one process. That is that administrative process and it is that incentive to the applicant to apply for a special use one versus a special use two if they want it reduced hours. If their establishment is gonna close at 11 p.m. during the week, there's no need to apply for a special use two. They meet the criteria, they can apply for a special use one. So if they needed extended hours, they would apply for a regular restaurant designation and that would be a special use two and that's what comes before council. So we already have an incentive for an applicant in the code if they have reduced hours of operation and they meet the, the qualifications, then they can just go straight to an administrative review. And so council, lastly, I just would like to review in consideration of those items, um, council did express a desire to consider reducing hours of operation for businesses. Um, we just want to just make sure council is aware that would include two things, the amendment of chapter 14 and the amendment of chapter 27. Staff took into consideration the fact that we do have that in, embedded in our code currently for the restaurant designations where someone can apply for an administrative review. And it is that incentive and also it avoids council hearing every case that comes before them for a restaurant because they want to late hours. So we already have it embedded. So at this time, staff's recommendation was that no change be made to the hours of operation. And I'm going to pause here for a second for any questions from council. Any questions, gentlemen? All right, being none, stop the negativity. Oh. Mr. Cross, we recognize. One yes. thing you mentioned is, uh, in the beginning is the, the alcohol license going with the owner instead of the property. Is that something? That's that coming. Oh, okay. That's coming. Item number four, yes. Okay, council, so we'll move on. The next um, topic, the item was convenience stores. And there was um, a concern regarding the uses surrounding the convenience stores. These are establishments that in many cases have already had alcoholic beverage sales approvals. These approvals are older approvals. Um, so what I wanted to do is just to provide for you, one, just how the convenience store use is defined in the code, in the zoning code, and also to review that the use of a convenience store for alcoholic beverage sales, it is a special use one. It is an administrative review, and these are the standards in which um, would apply if someone were to apply for it and receive approval. But one thing to keep in mind is with the convenience store uses, it is a package sales <coughs> permit that they receive. So consumption cannot occur on, on premise, and not only can it not occur on premise, you must be 500 feet away from the establishment to consume. So I know that there's, there's been certain locations that may have um, certain activity, let's say in the parking lot or near that location. Um, if someone purchases anything, any alcohol from that location, they must be 500 feet away from that establishment to consume it. And also, as a part of their special use one approval, no sales are allowed within the parking area or the loading spaces. So we, know, we understand there's a concern regarding the proximity of the convenience stores to residential. You know, I think you know, for my district, and um, I, I think what has happened throughout the decades is that we've allowed liquor stores to be in those communities. <laughs> And those liquor stores bring on undesirables. They bring on criminal activity. You know, a convenience store versus you, it's a little bit different than having these liquor stores inside of communities. Uh, and I can tell you that experience. I, when I used to go to work at 5 in the morning, people were waiting for it to open uh, those small stores for their medicine. We call it back in there, their medicine. 
Uh, and that's the problem I have because we have a multitude of liquor stores inside of the east side of town, and they're not in other communities. And I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking we maybe need to look, we need to take a look at that to where we don't allow liquor stores to be inside of communities, maybe the outer perimeter, but not inside of communities. That's my biggest concern. Mr. Citra, you recognize? If, if I may, with that, uh, for the, the viewing audience, uh, liquor store, convenience store, find convenience stores and the type of alcohol they can sell for people that are watching now yes yes so a convenience store can have sales of beer um, or beer and wine and that is they must also have a state license the state license must be a one APS which is for beer or a two APS which is for beer and wine that is their state license. In order to sell alcohol in the city of Tampa, you must have a city license and a state license. So in and this term, must... convenient store, yes. is it safe to say that convenient stores can only sell beer and wine? Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Councilman Goods, to your, to your suggestion and to your comments, um, staff did um, in the research of convenience store uses, we did consider that um, council could consider adding a requirement that um, new establishments have a distance separation requirement from residential, if that is council's direction. I'm not to hop on the convenience. My biggest thing is right now the, the liquor stores. That's the, the biggest issue we have with these liquor stores. Which those are a little different. If it, if it is a liquor store, then they are retail sales establishment for liquor and to be inclusive of beer and wine. Um, and it's a little bit different than a convenience store, but it's something we can certainly consider if council would like or. Okay. One of the things that you look at and you say, how can it be changed? Very difficult because it runs with the land. Right. It is forever. Let's face it. So you're, you're caught in your own world of trying to fix something and you can't because the law wasn't our law. That was a law that was given to us by the state of it, if I recall. So I don't know why that came about. I would imagine, I, as anybody wants to guess, but if it didn't go with the land, then you have a chance to revive that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. There's where the problem comes in. Yes, sir. If we had the authority to not make it with the land, it would change everything, but we don't have that authority. Am I correct? Correct. That's the problem. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, Mr. Bureau. Thank you, sir. Sorry, and and I, and you know, you're, you're fine, man. I, I'm all the way here in my corner here. Um, and I wanted to echo what the chairman said, because if you talk to a lot of residents in places like East Tampa, Sulphur Springs, and other places, that is one of the great critical issues, which is, the many number of liquor stores that come up and the great displeasure of, of many in the community on the detrimental effects that they have um, on, on the community in so very many ways. Um, and, I, and I wish that there was some sort of a way, you know, legally in which we could look at certain areas um, that, that for what, whatever term you want to use, blight, whatever it may be, um, where we can place more scrutiny on uh, uh, additional liquor only establishments there um, in deference to that because of the known detrimental effects that they have on the surrounding areas. I, 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 I would love to see that, something to that effect if we could. I don't know if that's so, but to the extent that we could, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see that. Because a lot of times these plans, these uh, uh, rezoning requests, et cetera, come before us and our hands are tied. And a lot of folks say, well, you're putting more liquor into these communities and, and, our, and our hands are tied. And I think there's a lot of displeasure on that from uh, city council. So I wanted to echo that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. McAlpha, did I see your hand, sir? Yes, sir. You're recognized. Uh, and this is regarding, you know, uh, it goes with the land. I know that the center of effects can be answered. But Mr. Councilman Miranda uh, answered uh, what I was going to ask him. And that was, you know, it's coming down from the state. So, of course, we're preempted again. Um, because somebody was asking me, what's the big deal with a, a uh, alcoholic beverage? You know, why is it you know, a hearing? And why are people against it? Because it goes with the land. What does that mean? It goes married to the property. Now, if that bar, restaurant, liquor store closes, it's always a wet zone property. 
And why was it important? <coughs> um, I assume because it makes that property more valuable and it's easier to sell in the future. Whoever passes it on, look at the budget. I mean, you, really, you don't have to do it. We already dealt with the process, and you're ready to go. So again, it's it's about money. Just like the later discussion about uh, rent stabilization, it's about money. Um, and again, our hands are tied because of what the state tells us we can and cannot do. So, thank you. Ms. Velez, okay. you have something to say? Oh, Jumped up there. Susan Johnson Velez, Legal Department. I, did, I just did want to address, you know, the, the city used to process alcoholic beverage approvals through their wet zoning process. And some of the old ones that you see that date back, um, some of the ones that you might be talking about, Council, uh, Mr. Chair, um, in East Tampa and other neighborhoods that, that date back, you know, decades. Um, that are wet zonings. We now process them as a special use permit, an AB permit is a special use permit, but both of those processes do result in an approval that does run with the land as we've, it attaches to the land and it's an, an entitlement once you approve it. Um, you have two years to implement the special use permit and if you do that, then, then it's tied to the land barring any type of suspension or revocation that might happen in the future. Um, not to say that that's the only way to do it, but our current regulatory scheme does um, process them as special use permits, and, and it's one of many special use permits that we, you know, a school or an, a multifamily unit, that's, that's also a special use permit, and all of those run with the land, as does the AB special use permit. Thank you. And, and, and Mr. Council. Chair, for me, oh. and, and that brings me to the questions that Unless a bar or a restaurant brews their own beer, has their own special label wine, or distills their own liquor, uh, liquor, what does a restaurant need a package store for? I, 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 can, I can understand, yes, we have our own products. Yes, we're selling growlers. Yes, we make our own wine. Yes, we make distill our own liquor. I understand that. But going back again with the land, a restaurant says, we want to be a package store. We want to sell food. Six, eight, ten months later, they close down. Guess what? The next owner gets to open a package store. I, I, it, it, it's just beyond me why a restaurant would need to be a package store. And I know you're going to give me a simple explanation, but it, 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 that's the first thing I ask when, I, uh, when a restaurant comes in and says, we want to have off-site uh, sales. Off premises. Why? Well, Councilman Citro, um, LaShawn Dock, City Planning. Um, keeping in mind that the alcoholic beverage sales is tied to the use. So let's say you have a restaurant establishment. It is for consumption on premise only. I, 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 if they're I, I, going I, to do the package and they want to offer it to go, a venue classification, you're into a different category. I, I may have spoke prematurely, and, and I, I apologize for that, but we've been hearing things about mixed use, and you put in 500 square feet in a 30,000 yes. square foot building, they call that mixed use. You go into a, now an establishment that is closed down that used to be a restaurant, you sell a bag of potato chips, does that still make you a restaurant? So my my point tenant, is, is, oh, yes. is we have I'm certain sorry. conditions that we're voting on, and it changes use or it sells, where are our guidelines for that? How, how can we go to the public and say, yes, we, we gave the permission for this establishment, but now look what it's turned into? That, that's, what, that's my only question. Yes, so any new establishment, so you have one establishment that's open, it closes, and a new establishment comes in. So that new establishment should have the same sales or the same, meet the same criteria as the what is approved for that property. If they do not, they are in violation and they're required to come in and renew. And they need to obtain Thank a designation sure. appropriate for their use. Um, the other is just to put on the record, uh, when a use is approved, it's a special use for alcoholic beverage sales. So the one way that that use would cease is if that use is under violation or let's say the use can voluntarily, for a special use, if it is not active, um, for 180 days, then it would it would cease. So it can go dry. A location can go dry, or a location can maintain their alcohol. Repeat that again, Ms. Dodd. It, it can out. go dry because what? Repeat that again. Yes, it is a special use. The alcoholic beverage sales is a special use. 
So after a, it must remain active. So a tenant leaves the location, a location can voluntarily extend their ability to sell alcohol. They can go under a 180 day extension. And that gives them time to find someone else to lease the location, to reestablish the sales. If they do not, they can go dry. We also have tenants that come to us and say they want to go dry just because their next tenant is not going to sell alcohol. Okay. So, and I'm sorry, just to Susan Johnson Velez, uh, legal department, just, just to follow up on, on Councilman Cito or to respond in part. Um, the, the very things that you talked about, you know, the next establishment that comes along, they can do something different than what the, the potential applicant that may be before you for seeking a special use permit for alcoholic beverage sales. So this is why when you do consider these applications, you need to consider every possible iteration of use that could happen at that location, not just necessarily the proposal that is being presented to you by that particular applicant. Okay, thanks so much, Council. And so we'll move on. The next um, item for discussion is the distance separation, and this is within urban villages. Um, at the last workshop on distance separation, we presented to you the distance separation requirements. We discussed the um, comprehensive plan, why there was no distance separation to residential in the urban villages. Um, that change was made back in 2009, around the time of 2009 or 2010. And um, it was to be consistent with the comprehensive plan because in, in urban villages, it encourages a mixture of uses. So the intent is that in urban villages, you would have the ground floor commercial with eyes on the ground and you'd have residential above. So that was not incorporated into the distance separation requirement. So the only requirement for distance separation is to other AB sales establishments. And what we did was I just wanted to remind council of the number of cases that we receive each year. I just pulled a snapshot from 2018 and 2019. And this is our special use two requests that come before you for alcoholic beverage sales. And you can see, for example, for 2018, we had a total of 19 applications for the year. And of those 19 applications, 15 of those requested a waiver, some sort of distance separation waiver. And then it's broken out to tell you the type of waiver granted. Um, and for 2019, there were a total of 21 applications and 20 of those requested distance separation of some sort. So we look at the volume of what was received and processed um, and we felt the volume was minimal for um, the request process as a special use too. So staff initially recommended based upon that, that no change would occur. We recommended not to change the code um, just because it may result in additional waivers, especially in those areas, in those urban village areas where we know a mixture of uses would be encouraged. Um, but after additional research, um, staff does recommend that council could consider reestablishing the distance separation for residential and that could be considered when AB cells are located within a single use or a strip commercial center. And this would also be inclusive of maintaining that zero feet distance separation when it's vertically integrated, when that mixture of use is vertically integrated, because that is what is encouraged in the urban villages. So council, if you would like to consider that, we certainly can bring that language for you or we can have I'm the code as it at, is currently. Uh, what I call your entertainment districts, you know. Uh, you know we have, it's booming now, everyone wants to have an establishment and, that, and those distances aren't 250, it's, I mean 200, 250. That's, it's, not, it's not realistic at this particular point. So we've been granting, and I would assume most of those you've been granting have probably been for Ebor probably. Mm -hmm. like a lot of concern is just, it, it, well, we want to hurt them to change, but again, we have problems in residential areas. That I don't know we can mix the two because then someone will say, well, it needs to be for all versus just you know, one. So then you again, you run into a dead end block. Yes, keeping in mind any new, if we were to modify the code, it would be for any new request. Anyone that already has approval would, of course, maintain them. That would be a problem. Any other questions, gentlemen? 
Pascal? From, and I, I'm, not, I'm not good with math, but uh, I, we, we approve these waivers at almost 80%, you know? So there's high probabilities that when applications come before us, you know, they have a good chance of getting approved. So we just keep it on a case-by-case -case basis instead of, you know, making a blanket change like you had already mentioned. Okay. Stop. Okay. All right. Um, that concludes um, that discussion on distance separation. What I'm going to do is turn it over to Susan Johnson Velez now to discuss the um, wet zoning. So, Council, this was the request, um, and I think we've had this discussion earlier regarding the wet zoning running with the land. Um, versus it running with the operator, and um, we're available if you have any questions on it. Any questions, gentlemen? All right. <coughs> okay, thanks so much, and I'll turn it back over to Abby. Thank you, LaShawn. Thank you, Council. Abby Feely, Director of Development and Growth Management. Um, just to um, wrap up, we have four uh, items that were under staff reports on your agenda this morning. The first one is uh, the design exceptions. And that is item uh, number 11 that was on your uh, agenda. I did provide a memorandum discussing design exceptions and the public notice that goes with them. Um, let me just take that down because it's confusing. Okay. Um, and I don't have anything there. I think we're done with there. There you go. Thank you. Um, so design exceptions, I talked about special uses this morning, ones and twos. Design exceptions also have ones and twos. Design exceptions actually um, came about in 2009. Uh, they were a memorialization of what used to be the administrative variance process. Um, and the two classifications, DE1s, design exception ones, do not have public notice. DE2s do have public notice. In my memo, I talked to you about what is encompassed in each of those. Um, predominantly, the design exception twos, which provide the notice, are reductions to setbacks um, that are throughout the city, not in a special district. Okay, so if you're on Davis Island, you are on South Dale Mabry, you are, and you are seeking a setback reduction, that is a DE2. If you are in the overlay districts, um, West Tampa, East Tampa, um, Seminole Heights, that comes in as a DE1. That DE1 does not have notice. So I'm gonna go through what those are, those special districts, overlay districts, supplemental regulations, so parking waivers, um, the ability for your townhomes to face an interior court, not face the street, uh, wetland reduction, wetland setback reductions, fences, um, this includes reverse framing of fences, so fences are required. Um, to have the nice side facing your neighbor. In some circumstances, they ask for that to be changed. That comes in as a DE1, um, and the criteria, and they review it. Uh, changes to buffers um, is also a DE1, um, and so those do not have public notice right now, and I think you've received some comments and things about this is being done in the dark, this is how this, this is what the code says. These processes are codified. We are in the process of addressing the standard operating procedures, but DE1s, rezonings, variances, their process for processing, the application requirements, the time frames, the reviews, where they go, who, that is in the code. Um, so we are in formalizing what is currently in the code and putting that into standard operating procedures, but th those are in the code. So, what is the difference in the DE1s not having notice? Um, you know, I provided you how many DE1s and how many DE2s um, that we processed in 2021. And it was roughly over um, close to 350 that uh, the team did. There were um, 14 denials, and two of those denials were came on appeal. Um, one of them, uh, council um, upheld the zoning administrator in their determination and the other one the applicant changed and modified the request and it was able to be approved administratively and the appeal did not come so if what happens when you provide that public notice is you provide a standing for a third-party appeal 
Um, and the way we look at this is we can provide make design exception ones require public notice. That would be an additional 300 applications that may come to city council on appeal. When the design exception went into place and the code was changed, council agreed that those would be the items that would be reviewed administratively and gave that administrative authority to the zoning administrator, which is Eric, he's here today, um, and, and that is how they're processed. And there is a set of criteria in 2760 that go with the DEs. So the question was, why aren't they noticed? Um, what is the possibility of noticing them? Um, this memo addresses that. And then secondly, it makes a recommendation to you that for the setbacks in the special districts, which is currently a DE1 with no notice, we would like to unify that and make that a DE2 like the rest of the city so that it does get noticed. But in relation to the other things I mentioned, the fencing, the buffering, the wetland setbacks, um, we would like to retain those as DE1s with no public notice, but that is ultimately up, up to council and if the recommendation is made that all of those applications are required to do notice, um, then we would prepare and, and start processing that. Any questions on that gentleman? Move on. Um, the next item is the neighborhood text amendment and, and Kate is going to speak to that and then I'll finish up on the form based and the affordable housing which you'll see is wrapped into what I'd like to bring back to you in our next workshop. Thank you and Council, my presentation will take about 10 minutes. I know we're reaching the lunch hour. I didn't know if you wanted to move we're forward. Try to get through. I think Council wants to try to get through these last couple of presentations okay. and that way, because we know one third of the attack hour. And I've got copies of the memorandum that was filed with City Council on February 21st, as well as a copy of Section 27 and 149 to the extent that it's helpful for any of the Council members. The panel. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. For the record, Kate Wells, Chief Assistant City Attorney. I'm here on item number 12, proposed amendments to the public hearing notice requirements in Chapter 27, which has also been referred to as the Neighborhood Text Amendment Proposal. This started as a privately initiated text amendment, and on June 24th of 2021, City Council made the motion directing staff to appear and discuss the proposal. In response to Council's motion, and in order to better understand the purpose of the proposal, LaShawn Dock spoke with Stephanie Pointer and Carol Ann Bennett on September 21st of 2021. That was followed by another meeting on October 19th with City Representatives and Stephanie Pointer, Carol Ann Bennett, Kelly Scharf, Colley Denault, and Jane Strohmeyer. As was shared with the City, the purpose of the proposed amendments before you is to provide increased awareness of public hearings. So I want to take a moment to talk about notice, and I don't know if I've got access to the wolf. There it is. Excellent. Statutory notice requirements for rezonings and other land use decisions are set out in section 166.041 of the Florida statutes. These require an ordinance to be read on two separate days and for notice to be published in a newspaper 10 days prior to adoption of the ordinance. Supplemental notice requirements are set out in section 27-149 uh, of the city's land development code, and these require mailing notice to property owners within 250 feet of the subject property, as well as to registered participating organizations, as well as posting notice on or near the front of the property. Both the statutory and supplemental notice requirements are intended to provide interested members of the public with information about the land development application or ordinance to provide sufficient time for those interested members of the public to determine how the application or ordinance may or may not affect or impact their interests and finally to allow an opportunity to participate in the public hearing before official action is taken. So the neighborhood text amendment proposal is requesting the following changes 
to chapter 27. So in addition to the existing requirement to mail notice to property owners at their mailing address, the proposal would also require notice to be mailed to the physical address. Notice would also be mailed to renters within the notice area. And for applications requesting, um, oh, one thing, the notice area would be increased for all applications from 200 feet to 500 feet. And for those applications requesting multifamily residential, commercial, or industrial uses, the notice area would be increased to a quarter mile and a community meeting would be required 30 days prior to the council hearing. Um, they're also requesting that we include available contact information for registered participating organizations, and if none exist, to include the contact information for the abutting registered participating organizations. In addition to the existing requirement to mail notice to all participating organizations registered within the neighborhood area, they would want that all registered organizations within the abutting area as well receive notice and then include a full-size copy of the most recently filed site plan for those types of applications that are site plan controlled. Staff researched the notice requirements of other jurisdictions. A summary of the research is attached to the memorandum and you will find that the notice areas range between 200 feet and 500 feet. And again, the city's current requirement is 250 feet. Hillsborough County, in recognition of the density experienced throughout the county, requires a 300-foot notice area for land use applications within its urban service area and 500-foot notice area elsewhere. Staff found that while the notice areas may not be consistent across local governments, the notice areas are consistent within each local government and do not differ based upon the requested use. The proposal before you also requests amending the definition of a grieved person. In our code, it's currently defined as an applicant or any owner of property within the 250-foot notice area of the subject property. The proposal would include property owners within the expanded notice area, as well as participating organizations within the subject area and those abutting the neighborhood area. So given the proposed changes to the notice area and to the definition of a grief person, I want to take a moment to talk about standing to challenge land use decisions. In general, persons adversely affected by the action of zoning agencies have a status as parties sufficient to entitle them to petition court for relief. The party bringing the action must show that the zoning action adversely affects its legally recognizable interests. Under common law, unlike the city's definition of a grief person, receipt of notice does not automatically confer standing. The fact that a person is among those entitled to receive notice is a factor considered by the court on the question of standing, but it is not controlling. For example, courts have found that neighboring property owners affected by zoning changes have standing. However, courts have recognized the difficulty in determining whether a decision affects a certain land as the distance increases between the land subject to the decision and the land of the person challenging the decision. The concept being the impact of the land use decision is lessened the further away one's property is from the subject property. Stated another way, the impact of the land use decision becomes more remote and speculative the further away one's property is from the subject property. With respect to the neighborhood text amendment proposal, there has not been any discussion which would suggest that owners of property beyond the current notice area of 250 feet may have legally recognizable interests that may be adversely affected by a land use decision. So in addition to the legal issues raised by the proposed amendment, there are practical issues that must be considered. Section 27-27. 149 establishes the notice requirements for all types of land use decisions, including rezoning, special use, variances, certificates of authority issued by the ARC and the BLC, and the review hearings. And at the direction of the Development Services Advisory Team, and in an effort to establish uniformity and predictability within the code, this section was amended by Council in December of 2020 to create a uniform standard of notice for all applications. The proposal before you would shift direction away from this uniform approach. 
It is also practically impossible to establish the identity and address of renters within any notice area. Unlike ownership, which is established by records maintained by the Hillsborough County property appraiser, there is no objective method to establish a list of renters within any defined area. The list of participating organizations maintained by the city is not established by the location of the subject property and instead is based upon organizations that have elected to opt in and request to receive notice within certain areas. The proposal will also likely increase the clerk's time in reviewing affidavits of compliance and increase the probability of a missed notice. So, one last overhead. Given the stated purpose of the proposal, which is to increase the awareness of public hearings, the city recommends that we keep the notice requirements as currently codified in section 27-149 that we amend the definition of a grief person to align with the common law definition and not base it solely upon inclusion within a notice area, and that we amend chapter 27 to require all applicants for rezoning and special use applications to hold a community meeting either before the application is filed with the city or prior to the city council hearing. If council is supportive of those recommendations, the amendments could be processed in the July 2022 cycle. Staff with the Department of Development and Growth Management is also recommending alternative forms of increase in awareness of public hearings, which do not require a code amendment. The department is launching, it's called the Development Coordination Current Application Map, which will provide real-time information on pending applications. And starting in May, staff anticipates having a video which will highlight the interactive map and how to transition from the map to the current record in, in Excella. In addition to that, the department is also in the process of reestablishing the homeowner's night sessions for continued public education of the services provided by the department. And they're also looking into holding regular training sessions with neighborhood organization leaders and the general public with instructions on how to access property and case information in Excella. So I know I've covered a lot of information and certainly didn't go into the detail that is covered in the memorandum, but I'm available to answer any questions. Mr. Carlson, you recognize Mr. Vera. Yeah, I wonder, uh, um, I, I'm happy to make a motion to move forward on the recommendations, but should we wait till everybody else speaks? No, if everybody speaks, it'll be fine. Ms. We'll wait till everybody speaks. Ms. Vera? Uh, yeah, and thank you very much. And Ms. Wells, thank you for your very, very, very detailed <laughs> memo. I, I, cause that, that took a lot of time, I'm sure. A lot of uh, what would be billable hours if you were a shoemaker, right? I'd be a billable trend. queen right now. There you go, I, I know that world. No, but you know, and one thing I'd like to look at, and, I, and I'm not gonna ask this as a question, cause Lord knows you've done enough work, is to see what other cities require, and if we're above or below that, you know, with regards to what the motion uh, dealt with, I think there's a lot of good things there that we can look at. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the issues with regards to community meetings, et cetera, in part can be dealt with by the community benefits ordinance in part, in part, some of the spirit of that, you know, kind of what bothers me in terms of putting more uh, regulations on developers at this time and, and, and the staff recommendations, I don't think do that, but is the serious backlog that we have in cases and then putting on more, more ways in which you can potentially screw up. I, 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 again, something that's very, very well-meaning, but I would worry about for the full scope of the request of the motion, uh, unintended consequences, particularly whenever it comes to uh, small property owners, et cetera. You know, something is, as I think Councilman Carlson is gonna motion for, that's uh, consistent with what staff was recommending. Um, I, 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 for, from what I hear, I'd be amenable to that. What I worry about is expanding rights um, and uh, the number of ways in which either uh, an applicant or the city staff can inadvertently screw up and thereby leading to more litigation, uh, which is certain, but you know, more openness and more transparency and getting uh, the word out to uh, uh, local neighborhoods and communities on what's going on. I'm 110% for that, uh, compelling developers uh, and folks who want to build in, in communities to be open about it and meet with uh, uh, community neighborhoods and talk about ways in which they're going to be investing in the neighborhoods. Again, that's separate. That's the community benefits <laughs> ordinance. I'm 110% for that. But making more ways in which somebody can stumble, um, uh, particularly when we have such a big backlog, that's a narrowly tailored part of the, of the motion that I would be uh, just, you know, 
skeptical of, again, not necessarily against it, I'd be open to talking about it, but something that we should ap approach with some level of, of, of skepticism and scrutiny. But that's it. Thank you very much. And again, uh, Ms. Wells, thank you for that, because I know that took a lot of time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wren, you next? I'm going to give you a short version. Thank you, Ms. Wells. When you look at 250 feet or 500 feet or 1,320 feet, it may be to someone's advantage or someone's disadvantage. If you're looking at something within some distance to what, I'm just going to use an example, to split a lot, and you look at it within 250 feet, it may or may not be acceptable. But if when you want 500 feet and you're looking at that same location where you say, well, it's not acceptable within 200, but you look at 500 feet, and guess what? Now you got multi lots on some blocks that were 100% split. So then it becomes palatable or acceptable. So it makes no difference in my mind the 1,300, 500, or 200, or 250 feet, because it depends on what section of the city are you looking at that could focus and make a change or a difference mathematically to approve or disapprove. Thank you very much. Ms. Citrus, recognize. And the questions to the uh, owner and the renter getting noticed. And if there is any input from both owner and renter, is that two votes, yay or nay? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in extending. Extending. Uh, is there any state precedence of legalities of that? And, and then who has the burden of proof and or who has to prove otherwise with any type of uh, decisions made by any councils or commissions? You know, if we're talking about extending the notice area beyond the 250 yes, foot notice area, there needs to be a discussion to show that those included within the notice area have rights that could be adversely affected by the proposed rezoning. So um, when you in, attached to the, the memo was some of the research that we had done, the city of Jacksonville has a 350 foot notice area. Um, Orlando for planned developments, 400 feet. For Euclidean, 300 feet. St. Petersburg, 300 feet. Madeira Beach, 200 feet. Miami, 500 feet. Clearwater, 200 feet. So we would want to have that discussion as to why are we going beyond 250 feet um, and what are those interests that um, property owners have um, that could be impacted, adversely impacted by, by the proposed use. And that was where we were just talking about doubling the notice area throughout the city and going to a quarter mile for certain uses, there's been no discussion that would substantiate the need to expand the notice area. So that would have to occur, um, it would be my recommendation that that occur with city council before we would consider expanding the notice area. Um, again, this started as a privately initiated text amendment and then council asked um, to move forward with it as a publicly initiated. But there's, there's just not been that discussion other than the request here was to increase public awareness of hearings. Well, on the very front end of applications being filed with the city, the city issues the CARES newsletter. That identifies different types of applications that are filed. That with the interactive map that um, Abby has on, on the Wolf, that allows folks, if you're talking about public awareness, that allows you, if you get on the CARES newsletter distribution, you can then get on the interactive Mac and you then pull up the records in Excella. That, that is providing a significant amount of information at the very front end of the process and months in advance of, of a hearing at council. So I, I, when, when we start talking about expanding the notice area, it, it does relate to standing for folks to then challenge your decisions. So that needs to be a carefully crafted solution um, and based on evidence before this council that folks within the notice area are somehow potentially adversely affected or <coughs> could be by the proposed rezoning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, anyone else? All right. All right, Ms. Wells, anything else? Thank you. Just if there's going to be a motion of council uh, with respect to the recommendations so that we know how to move forward. I'm just, I'm just going to hold my motion until later. Thank you. All right. 
Abby Feely, Director of Development and Growth. Council, I'm, I'm here to speak on number 12, and I had signed up to speak on that. All right. Were you going to a different one, Abby? Or I, I was, Mr. Michelini. Um, I, I hear your voice. Should I start? You Council? want to speak on the item just uh, Ms. Wills just talked about, sir? Yes, sir. All right, I'll, I'll let you go. It's the workshop. I'll let you go and speak on it. Sir. And I'm and I'm signed up to speak on that. Um, let me just say a couple things here regarding the notice area. Um, when you increase that from 250 feet to 500 feet, I, I know that's a number in your in your minds, but it, it exponentially increases the number of properties that have to be noticed. And currently, uh, for a typical notice, you're you're sending out 60 to 75. Uh, letters which is about 300 uh, to 375 dollars they cost the postage on that is five dollars per envelope that doesn't include the labor or the copies uh, or anything else involved in that when you when you take it to 500 feet you have in now increased the postage to 1,000 to 1250 dollars uh, that's plus your all of the other labor and issues that I've already spoken about um, and as the staff has pointed out, there is, has been no discussion whatsoever regarding why this should be increased. The notice hasn't been perfected. Um, and one out of probably four of your petitions end up being misnoticed as they are now. Um, you already required to notify the homeowner association as part of the noticing requirements. It goes out in a newsletter that also is, is sent to all of the registered no, uh, homeowner associations. <clears throat> the, uh, the signs are all posted on the property that identify this property as being subject to, um, to a, a consideration by the city council or the variance board or the, you know, the, the barrio or the ARC. And um, the in instructions on that are, you know, when you, when you order these maps, they give you a very detailed mailing list that has to be certified by the property appraiser when you send it out. So when we're talking about these notice, and, and we've talked about urban environments versus suburban environments, this is an urban environment, and that's what happens. Um, let me just show you one, one map here on the overhead of what, what happens when you expand that. You've gone, and I just picked some, some random addresses. They're not specific to any petition that was pending. But now this is a 500-foot radius map. Um, and it's over in the um, over in the West Tampa area versus uh, you, you can see exactly what happens and if you hit a condo or you hit uh, something like that you're, you've in some cases you're sending out notices to over 600 people and it gets cost prohibitive and you, not all of these projects are for major developers some of these are mom and pops and uh, if as Councilman Vieira pointed out, if you want to have a requirement for a note for a homeowner association meeting, perhaps you, you create a threshold between small projects and large projects and cut it off at an acre as opposed to just across the board and make all of them be required to have a homeowner association meeting. Um, but anyway, th th it is cost prohibitive. There's been no precedent, uh, no, no information presented that somehow somebody didn't know about a meeting uh, or know about a change. And as uh, Councilman Miranda pointed out, this may be a positive matter, it may be a negative matter, depending on how far you go out and what the nature of the request is. So with, the, with those exceptions, we'd support the, uh, the staff uh, presentation as, as presented. Thank you, Mr. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Council. I, I will wrap up. I think about seven, eight minutes. We can finish the last two items for you. And um, I do have uh, one last slide as well. The um, next staff report on your agenda was the form based zoning opportunities. I did file a memorandum with you in December related to that. The form based code was an initiative back from 2008 uh, that. <coughs> Seminole Heights got completed. There was some other initial work done with the 40th Street area. Um, and then there were other areas that were slated for, uh, for further codes. Um, the city did not complete that, those efforts. Um, some, like I said, preliminary work was done. 
Uh, at this time, what I'd like to do is go back out to 40th Street and to Tampa Heights um, to have a discussion and see what they were understanding was the objective of those codes and what was going to be achieved. And um, we would look at perhaps uh, some corridor overlays or some other mechanisms that may work in concert with their desires for those areas. The city planning team, land development, we, we're not in the forum-based code business anymore, so to speak. I mean, that just is a strategy from 10, 15 years ago, you know, that just is not where we're headed today. So um, I read Mr. Seal's email about promises and other things. We would like to make that promise to have that discussion with the neighborhood and see what we could do um, at this time to move uh, their objectives forward. All right. Um, let me just pop back on. If you can see May that. I ask one question yeah, here, Mr. Yes. Chairman? On, on, um, on businesses that are transferable, if one closes, uh, there's a process we have to sell like a drink a day or something like that. Oh, and for when a, an establishment goes dry? Right. When establishment goes dry, so when a business is learned, and we're jumping back now to the alcoholic and, and beverage discussion. The time That's okay. Um, yes, so they are posted after 30 days of non-sales, and then they have 30 days to resume sales. If they don't, then they are issued that, that they would approach the dry. Um, if they choose to do it voluntarily sometimes a business loses a tenant and they're like oh i know i have to sell they will put the city on notice that they have now lost their tenant or they're in process of remodeling and sales will not be taking place and then when they are ready to initiate sales again they come back and let us know but if sales cease any special use ceases operation for a period of 180 days they lose that special use i just wanted it on the record thank you very much okay so the last item, um, and I said I was going to ask this at the beginning, is um, I want to say thank you for today. I think it was a really good opportunity to have a very focused discussion on many items that you have had out there and give us a chance not to come in at 4 o'clock and kind of have to speed along with, with what we need to say. Because these matters are before you all the time, um, several nights a month. and. Um, I think it was really important. But I would like to ask that we could possibly have June 23rd um, as the next growth management and planning workshop to bring back to you other items that are still out there that didn't get bundled in today. Um, and there on the screen for you are a couple of those items, the workshop items. So two weeks ago, I believe Councilman Dingfelder made a motion about the AHAC recommendations that we were before you in early December on with the housing and community development team and members of the AHAC were here um, and we talked about those. Um, we are packaging those in a potential code amendments for uh, housing code modifications and that would encompass those items. So that's at the top of the list for what we'd like to bring back to you June 23rd. That was item number six on your agenda today. Uh, the second is the bonus density that has been talked about, um, looking at the formula that's currently in the code, looking at whether or not we should just go back to all affordable housing. The electric vehicle, uh, that was a motion made by Councilman Citro just a few weeks ago. And then we do have some text amendments that are in process. The downtown development review process, that's the DDR when projects come in downtown. There's a space in the code for it, but the process had never been codified. So we're working on taking care of that. Also a local DRI process. And then lastly, um, that last set of privately initiated text amendments, before you changed the code and did away with privately initiated text amendments, we did receive several, um, and those are up there for you, Channel District, some natural resources, the Tampa Heights design standards, and then the CBD signed standards were all privately initiated amendments and we're working those through our system right now. So wanted to show you what's on deck. If it's the pleasure of council to go ahead and set that June 23rd workshop dedicated uh, to planning items again, we would love that opportunity to bring those matters back to you. Mr. Mescal? I'd like to make a motion that this be included in Second. Second by Mr. Sutra, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. 
And that is all we had for you for this Mr. morning. Carlson, do you have a motion you want to make, sir? Okay. All right. May, Citro? May, may I ask, uh, Ms. Post, Ms. Feely, you're there, and Ms. Johnson Velez or, or Ms. Wells should be there, are, are also here. Great report today, wonderful information. But just to keep it from being informational, is there any recommendations that this council make any type of motions uh, to make sure that this keeps moving forward as opposed to after today just disappearing? So um, Carol Post, Administrator for Development and Economic Opportunity, thank you, appreciate that. Um, as we sta stated at the outset in the workshop capacity, the idea is to get input, to get feedback, to ha have you give us further direction that is usually then incorporated into further future steps. So in fact, we, we don't necessarily need any motions per se. If anyone's in, um, um, interested in making a motion, certainly that is your prerogative. The one exception might be uh, to the presentation that Ms. Wells made. Um, that one now, it, this is sort of its last workshop. It's been before you on a few occasions. We have some definitive recommendations and input and feedback from the community groups already. So that one may be if there was an inclination to support our recommendations there, it would allow us to, to push that forward in the time frames that she presented. Otherwise, I think Abby has clear direction on uh, the, the wide range of matters that she brought before you. If, if, if I may, one more question. Uh, I, I'm going to assume that we are going to get a large amount of calls and emails about the discussion we had today. After we've heard from our constituents, would it be advisable to just revisit, shortly revisit with their concerns on some of the things that we've heard today? Absolutely. Not Again, that's the point of a workshop is to allow us, allow staff to share what its, uh, what its positions are, what its findings are, to bring some analysis to the, to the um, discussion and also to bring, as I stated at the outset, some of the compliance and regulatory obligations that we're subject to and then have that be open for discussion amongst council and absolutely amongst the public. Would June be the same time that Ms. Feely has asked for this? Mm -hmm. Just. Okay. To, to express the concerns of, of our constituents and maybe some things that we might think about between now and then. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to say, Abby Feely, um, we're, we're not not available to you before June. We're available to you every week. I mean, I know sometimes you're like, Abby Feely, are you out there? I'm always out there. So um, if you hear things and you would like at one of your upcoming meetings to report back or provide other direction or synthesize those thoughts with what you heard here today from us and provide other recommendations or motions, we're available for that, absolutely. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that map I put up, that is available today. It is open, live, and active. Anybody out there who wants to know anything that the development coordination office is processing can click on that map and see it live and in person. Um, because we want to provide that information and, and show what is being processed. Then my next question, then Mr. Chair, if I could, uh, Ms. Feely and Ms. Post, Ms. Post, you may, you may, you may not be here. So, uh, Ms. Feely, can, we, can you include some of this, what we talked about, in case we have any constituents concern in, in the meeting in June, which you already asked for? That's my, that is my motion. Second. Okay. Sigma, Mr. Miranda, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion granted. One last question to Ms. Feely. May I just comment before that question just to close the loop for you? That sure, go ahead. On, on public input, what we attempted to do this morning, and if it, it um, so suits uh, my successor and the, the, the path that they may take in the future, was to push the public comments to after the staff presentations or perhaps even align them so that you're hearing them sort of synchronized with the discussion, as you saw with the subsequent a couple of uh, uh, individuals that wanted to comment on a particular topic to sync those up. So that may be, be also a way programmatically that you could approach the June workshop. I, Ms. Feely, you and I will talk off offline. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. And I will post today's presentation on our website um, so that if anybody wants to go back and see that, I know it'll be available through council, but we can post it on development coordination as well. Mr. Thanks, Carlson, Mr. just quickly, um, you know, based on the feedback we got from the public this morning, if we're going to prefer or allow feedback um, after each section, we ought to just clearly notice it to everyone so the public knows. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Schell. Yes, and if I could follow up, Council, on that. Um, what you've been doing, it, it 
since the pandemic, as a result of the pandemic, is different than the way it used to be, which is what we had in the past. So my hope is that council was, is going to need to address this one way or the other, whether we have people come back into chambers, whether we go back to normal, and how we're going to, if we're going to continue with CMT, how are we going to meet that in, because the platform certainly puts a tremendous burden on the clerk's office, all for future discussion, but hopefully by June, maybe, hopefully, we'll be back to being able to address this in chambers. Right. Madam Clerk, you have a question? Yes, Councilmember Citro made a motion. Um, if he could possibly repeat it, that one kind of flew by. The discussion that we've had today that Ms. Abby Feely and city staff have presented, when was that date in June, Ms. Feely? June 23rd. To, to just briefly be rediscussed in case we have any type of input from our constituents on June 23rd. From today's workshop, sir? From today's workshop, yes. Thank you. And uh, who was the second? Councilman Miranda. Miranda. Madam Clerk, did you get it? All right, anything of this post? No, I just wanted to thank you again. Appreciate it. Wish you all uh, good uh, good luck with everything moving forward. All uh, and please stay in touch. All Appreciate right. it. We stand in recess to one third. I know.